Good morning. We are on the record. This is the digital video deposition of Bellin Lemus testifying in the matter of Bruno et al. versus County of Los Angeles et al. Case number 817CV01301 CJCJDE. Today we are located at 555 Anton Boulevard, Suite 1200, Costa Mesa, California. Today's date is October 18th, 2018. Time on the video monitor is 10.09 a.m. My name is John Immel. I'm the video specialist today. The certified shorthand reporter is Michelle Hutton. We represent Crown Court Reporting. Will counsel please introduce yourselves for the record? Sean McMillan appearing on behalf of plaintiffs. Megan Lieber for Defendants County of Los Angeles, Mary Cruz Perez, Jason Schmoker, John Lee, and the witness Bella Lemus who is present. Candace Hollock on behalf of Defendant Chalk Children's Hospital of Orange County. Brian Moore for Defendants County of Orange, Laura Todd, and Nicole Stratman. The reporter may swear in the witness. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you will give in this deposition will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I I do. Good morning, Ms. Lemus. Can you please state and spell for us your full name? Belen Lemus, B E L E N L E M U S. You have a middle initial? I don't, sir. Where do you currently work? I am assigned, um, well, I work for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and I'm currently assigned to Special Victims Bureau. Is there any particular sort of case that you normally deal with with the Special Victims Bureau? Um, I investigate cases that have to do with physical abuse, sexual abuse of children, uh, adult rapes, sexual assaults, uh, child pornography. <coughs> how long have you been doing that? That's sort of work, how long have you been doing it? Um, I would say Approximately five years. So like 2013 or so is when you started? Um, I started, I was assigned to special victims uh, on, October for, on October 2014. However, prior to that, I was assigned to that unit on loan uh, between 2009 and 2010. Okay. What do you mean by on loan? Um, I was assigned to a patrol station, to a patrol station, but because there were there were a lot of uh, backlogged cases, I went to assist. Assist with investigations or something else? No, with investigations, sir. <clears throat> Currently, you are a detective, correct? Yes, sir. When did you become a detective? Well, to special victims, uh, assigned at special victims. Uh, well, no, I mean. Overall? Just period. When did you first become a detective? Um, in 2007, April of 2007. Where were you assigned in April of 2007 when you first became a detective? At Carson Station. Any particular unit? No, I worked um, crimes against persons and I also worked property crimes. How long did you do that? Two years. So until about 2009? Yes, sir. When you were there at the Carson station, were you assigned to patrol? No, sir. Okay. What happened between 2009 and 2000? Oh, I apologize. Um, so after I left Carson station, I went back to patrol. Okay. Um, and I went to industry station. Were you still satisfying job duties at patrol as a detective? I would say yes when I worked overtime. Okay. 
and when you worked overtime, was that in situations similar to when you were on loan um, to the special victims unit? Where you would do your normal patrol duties, and then in addition to that, maybe you would be helping out clearing up a backlog of investigations or something like that. I'm not sure I'm understanding, sir. Um, so when I was assigned at Carson Station, uh, my, my assignment was Detective Bureau. Mm -hmm. I would also work overtime in the field where I would answer calls for service. Okay. That was just for overtime. And that was when you were at Carson Station? Correct. What about when you went back to patrol? Okay. So when I went to Industry Station, I went to work as a field, as a patrol deputy. As a, sorry? As a patrol deputy, answering calls for service. And that was my assignment. Was that a demotion? I guess, yes, it would be. Okay. Was there a reason for it? I still wanted to work patrol. I felt that my patrol time, I still felt I wanted to work patrol. I enjoyed it. You enjoyed <laughs> that work it. more? Yes, sir. Okay. So it wasn't that you were, um, let me make sure I understand this. It was a choice you made to go back to patrol, not something where management said, hey, you're going back to patrol. Correct. Okay. Then how long were you in patrol before you decided that maybe it wasn't so great after all and you wanted to be a detective? Well, um, when I went to Industry Station, they asked me to go on loan. After a few months there, they asked me to go on loan to special victims. That was only a temporary assignment. Mm -hmm. In 2010, I went back to patrol. Okay. So but for about a year you were on special assignment? For nine months, yes. Okay. Then you went back to patrol? Correct. Then? Um, from there I was called to, uh, I was called to work on loan to a homicide task force. When was that? Let me think, sir. You don't have to call me sir. I'm just a guy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Makes me feel old when you do that. <laughs> And I know I'm getting old, but I'm not quite there yet. Sean, I'm a lot younger than you, and she calls me ma'am, so <laughs> we'll throw that, that out there. Doesn't that make you feel uncomfortable? It, it does, but, you know, that's, that's what makes her comfortable, so. All right, well, I'd prefer you don't, but if, if it helps you, do what you need to do. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> so I, w I don't remember the exact dates, but I know um, I was on loan to the task force, uh, I believe, in 2010. For the, for the majority of 2010. Okay, that's the homicide tax, task yes, force. Sir. Okay. What did you do after that? I went uh, back to the field, uh, to industry station. So back to patrol? Yes, sir. Okay, and that was 2011-ish? Yes, it would have been late 2010 or early 2011. How long were you at patrol until you um, ended up going to Special Victims Unit as a detective on a permanent basis? After the, task, task, uh, after the task force, I went, well, I remained in patrol until October of 2014. Okay. Where did you go to high school? In City of Industry. Is there a name sure. of the high school? Yes, sir. William Workman High School. I'm sorry? William Workman High School. Did you go to college? Uh, some college, sir. Where at? Um, Mount San Antonio College. Where's that? City of Walnut. Is that a four-year college? Mm, two years, sir. Two years. Did you obtain a degree there? No. What'd you study? Um, I took um, my, I guess, the basic general education classes. When did you go there? I would say, I think right after high school, and then once I was hired on the, um, with the LA County Sheriff's Department. So I, it was, it wasn't where I went consistently, it was I took classes as I could. Okay, I got you. I sort of did the same thing with mine. It took me like 10 years. <laughs> you know, you do things. 
So when did you start? I mean, I, I understand you said directly out of high school you started taking classes. When would that have been? What year? Uh, it would have been 1994. Was there a period of time where you were there at San Antonio, Mount San Antonio College taking classes full-time? I never went full-time. Okay. So it was always part-time? Yes. And you didn't have any um, area of concentration that you were focused on? No, sir. Okay. How long was it from the time you started at Mount San Antonio until you started working with the Sheriff's Department, LA County Sheriffs? Well, I believe it would have been three years. So you started with LA County Sheriffs around 1997? Yes, sir, in July of 1997. And at that time, were you still at least part-time at Mount San Antonio? Yes, sir, on and off. It depended on my work schedule. Okay. When you first started with LA County Sheriffs, what capacity did you start in? I, I was employed as a custody assistant. What is that? Uh, I was assigned to work a jail facility and um, my duties were to obviously the security of the inmates. Secure inmates, what, what, what do you mean? What does that mean? Um, my duty was, was to oversee the, se the security of the inmates um, and then make sure that they um, had, you know, their meals or in their doctor um, visits. It was basically overseeing the inmates. Okay. Was it administrative or were you actually, you know, like in the jail hands-on? I was hands-on. Okay. Was that a woman's facility? No, sir. Okay. How long did you do that? I was uh, hired as a deputy in 1999, in April of 1999. I believe that's what it was, April. Hmm. So when you hired on originally <coughs> in 1997, July, with the County of Los Angeles, you were not a deputy? Correct. Okay, was that like what, like a civilian employee or something? Yes. Okay, so when you were in the jail, you weren't wearing like a gun and a stick and all that stuff? Correct, sir. Okay. Prior to being hired on by the County of Los Angeles Sheriff's Department as a deputy in April 1999, did you have any training specific to the job you would be doing as a deputy. That is before you were hired to be a deputy. I guess I would say I did have some training in regards to the inmate security because as a deputy if you're assigned to a custody facility you essentially do the same as a custody assistant. Or back then, that's mm -hmm. how it was. Okay. So did you get some training on the Eighth Amendment, how that might apply to uh, regulate in some way the way you interacted with prisoners at the prison? I'd have to agree, sir. Okay. Was that formal training? Well, um, we, as a custody assistant, you go through training uh, prior to getting or getting assigned to it. Uh, you have to go through an academy. I don't remember how long it was. Okay, so even just to become a custody assistant, you had to go through some sort of coursework? Yes, sir. Okay, and you, don't, you just don't remember how long that course took? No. Can you give me an estimate? Two months, four months? It wasn't, um, it wasn't four months. I don't remember if it was up to two months. I mean, I know okay. it was several weeks. Okay, and that training back then, that would have been training that you received sometime around 1997? Correct, in, in July. Okay. And then you receive further training aside from that before you became a deputy, is that correct?
if you're talking about if during the academy when I went to to be a deputy? Well, let me ask you this because maybe I'm misunderstanding. You had an academy, a series of academy courses you had to take to become a custody assistant, right? Yes, sir. Is that separate and apart from any further education or training that you had to undergo to become a deputy? Correct. Okay, so there's an, another series of courses you had to take. Yes, sir. And did you take those courses before becoming a deputy or after you'd been hired as a deputy? When I was hired as a deputy. So you took the courses after you'd already been hired? Correct. Okay. So that would have been sometime April or after April 1999? Correct, sir. And correct me if I'm wrong, but back then, when you first became a deputy, you were still assigned to um, the jail, right? Correct. How long did you do that? Um, and so I went back to custody as a deputy, and then I worked um, in the jails until... Sorry, so I'm trying to remember. Oh, that's okay. Um, until 2001. So I believe in early 2001 is when I went back to the academy, and I also and I and I went um, back for a 16 or 18 week training course. What was that for? Initially, when I got hired as a deputy, um, they, that was only a, a like a four or five week course. I don't remember where we just. Um, where we were limited in our duties, I was not able to go and work patrol because I didn't have the, the training okay. required for that. Okay, so there's different training required for each post, if I'm understanding? When I went through the, the program, yes, sir. Okay, so initially, when you were a custody assistant, there was specific training related to the, your job duties there, yes, right? Yes, sir. Then there was another four to five week course that you undertook to become or when you became a <coughs> custody deputy at the jail, right? Yes, sir. Then there was another 16 to 18 week course that you took when you went over to patrol. Yes, sir. When did you take that course, the 16 to 18 week course? I, if I believe it was sometime in mid-summer, sir. I, I know I graduated in October of 2001. Now that 16 to 18 week course, was that formal training where you actually were in a classroom type situation? Yes. Okay, and that was for the whole 16 to 18 weeks? Correct. Okay. Did they provide you written materials in that training? Yes. Okay. Did you maintain those written materials? I don't think I kept everything. What did you keep? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, sir. Um, I'm trying to think if I would have kept anything. It would have been like the policies for like the department. I mean, they give us, um, I mean, they gave us a lot of manuals. I don't remember. A lot of information. Yes. Sort of hard to keep track of all of it. As, as far as, yes, because we, like, for example, we had a, a like, a lecture on, on something, on a subject, um, like, those books that I used or to study, I would pass them on to other students who, who went through the academy. So it's, I mean, I don't remember specifically what I kept. But when we're talking about all that information, all that material over those 16 to 18 weeks, I think you said that it's a lot of information, right? Yes. And am I correct that there's so much there, in fact, that it's hard to keep track of all of it. Uh, Vague. But you can answer. Um, I, I mean, I guess I would say this. I, don't, I can't specifically tell you what, what information was given to me or what manuals or anything like that. You couldn't tell me what any of that specific training was? Um, the state's testimony. You can go ahead. Unless she tells you not to answer, um, you still have to answer. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, sir. I mean, I could tell you that we, we you know, there were like uh, learning domains on search and seizure. There were learning domains on child abuse, um, on domestic violence, on use of force, um, things like that.
When you say learning domains, what does that mean? That's just the, um, I guess, the name that they used for the actual uh, subject we were, they were teaching at the time. Okay, so like the name of the course? Yes. Okay. The course on search and seizure, the learning do domain on search and seizure. What do you remember about that? Vague and overbroad. If anything, if you don't remember anything, you can just tell me that. I mean, specifically, I can't mm -hmm. tell you exactly what they told me, but I know that it had to do with, um, you know, they, they taught us about when our, I guess, when we come across mm -hmm. um, people in the field, about um, searching a home, using warrants. Um, I mean, it's, there's a lot of information in regards to search and seizure. Do they teach you anything about the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution? Yes, sir. Okay. What do you recall of that? Just generally is fine. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know specifically. Um, yeah, I know. I, so it's about 2001, right? Well, in regards to search and seizure or the, or the Fourth Amendment, how uh, people have a right to, um, to privacy and, and uh, unwarranted seizure unless in their home, mm -hmm. um, in their persons. Uh, papers on effects unless there's a there's a, a, war, a probable cause mm -hmm. for a warrant. Okay. Well, unless there's actually either a warrant issued. Yes, sir. Probable cause standing alone is not enough, right? Yes, sir. Unless there's a signed, there's an actual signed warrant. Right. Or emergency. For if there's an emergency, then you don't need a warrant. Right? Oh, correct, sir. Um, yes. Okay. Exigency, um, exigent circumstances or consent. Okay. When is the last time that you had that sort of training? I know you had it back in 2001 in that uh, 16 to 18 week course, right? That's correct, isn't it? That you had that type of training regarding, you know, getting warrants, the Fourth Amendment, the exceptions that apply. You had that training as part of your 16 to 18 week course prior to becoming a patrol deputy, correct? Correct, sir. Okay. Have you had any of that type of training that is, on the Fourth Amendment, how it might restrict your powers as a law enforcement agent. Have you had any of that kind of training since your 2001 course? Yes. Okay. When was the last time that you had training regarding how the Fourth Amendment applies to restrict your powers as a law enforcement agent? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think the last time. The last time I can specifically remember, um, I think it would have been when I took the child abuse investigation course uh, in 2014. Okay, let me see if we can pin down a specific date for that. I'll show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 53. Which one is it? Yeah, okay, 53 to your deposition. <laughs> you know what? Even though Adrian did the copies, he only gave me three. I'm sorry. Somewhat inconsistent. note that on his next review. I will. I will. I'll say Adrian. Well, actually, he'll review the depot, so <laughs> he'll know exactly. He will be very embarrassed. <laughs> uh, can you take a moment, please, and review exib exhibit number 53? And it consists of several pages. In fact, while you're reviewing it, I'll just identify it. It, it uh, contains Bates numbered COLA00782 through and including page bearing Bates number COLA00788.
Where is that? Okay. Cool. What is that exhibit number 53, or what does it appear to you to be? Um, it's a list of courses that I have uh, completed. Okay. And when you said earlier that the warrant um, subject matter, the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, that subject matter, you believed it had been covered in your child abuse investigations training. First of all, did I understand you correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that training reflected here somewhere in Exhibit 53? Um, yes. Okay. And where is that? Um, I believe it would be the number, the third one on, on page 782. Okay. Can you do me a favor and just put a little star next to that? Do you know whether or not, as you're sitting here today, do you know whether or not the, the entries that follow that, that is the child abuse and neglect reporting training and the, actually there's two um, child abuse and neglect reporting trainings there on the bottom part of page 00782, right? Yes. Do you know, as you're sitting here today, whether either of those trainings also included uh, Fourth Amendment components? I don't know. I don't remember they specifically contained that. Okay. And then looking at the date here, December 12, 2014, on <coughs> the child abuse investigation training, would that have been when you completed the course? That would have been the, the date as far as December 24th. I mean, I remember I attended in, in December, I, I mean, in 2014. I, I specifically don't remember that date. Okay. Did you have to sign in? Yes. Did you get um, some sort of credit for it? Um, I believe I received like a certificate of completion for the, for the course. Okay. Is there a certain number of hours, <clears throat> is there a certain number of hours of education or continuing education that you're required to complete each year? Not that I'm aware of, sir, I don't remember. Okay, so this would have been something that you just were doing because you were interested, it wasn't something that was required? Well, this is something that um, I believe is required by the unit, by the Special Victims Bureau unit. Okay, so that's something that when you transferred into the Special Victims Unit, you would have been required to take to prepare you for your new job duties. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see, I have, well, let's do this one first. I'm going to show you exhibit number. 54. Again, sorry guys, just have two. <clears throat> you recognize that exhibit number 54? Yes. Okay, what I'm going to ask you to do, well, let me ask you this first. What is exhibit number 54? Um, it appears to be the training that I have received since I came on the department maybe? So like a training transcript? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you do me a favor and go through Exhibit 54, your training transcript, and identify for me, and again, you can just place a mark next to the course name on the left-hand side of the page, but identify for me those courses that you recall that would have contained a uh, component relative to how the Fourth Amendment, the search and seizure laws, and warrants might in some way impact the work that you would be doing as a law enforcement agent. at exhibit 54 now having gone through that exercise can you identify for me and we'll just go start with page 00789 identify for me by class number 
those courses that you recall taking that um, covered, in some respect, the restrictions imposed on you as a law enforcement agent under the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution? So I believe it would have been a 09087. Hold on, I got to get my glasses for this. 09087, you said? Yes, sir. Okay, that would have been the one titled Modified Academy? Yes, sir. And that um, you took that course in April 1999, is that right? Um, well, it says ending date, so I know it was sometime, it would have been sometime during that day. Okay. When, what is the next course? Uh, the Basic Academy. Uh, number? I'm sorry, uh, 00455. Okay, and again, that would have been sometime in October, November 2001 that you took that course? Yes, sir. Okay. When's the next one? Or I guess, what number is the next one? I'm not exactly sure, but I think we would have covered it in, in 09199. The racial profiling? Yes. And, but that one you're not certain of? No. Is that because uh, <coughs> you don't necessarily recall being trained that racial profiling would implicate the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure rules? Is that right? I mean, I think we, I think that covers that, but I'm, you know, I don't remember the specific training. Okay. But I mean, I would assume it does. Okay. Well, I don't want you to guess on okay. stuff. Okay. So I'm not going to guess, sir. Yeah. Okay. I just want you to things that you have a memory of, maybe a vague recollection of. That's fine but I definitely don't want you guessing, okay? Yes, sir. And you understand the difference between a, a guess and an estimate, right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I won't go through it then. What's, what's the next course number that you believe would have contained a component regarding how the Fourth <coughs> Amendment of the United <coughs> States Constitution <coughs> restricts your power and authorities as a law enforcement agent? Um. Patrol school, and that would be 02010. Okay, and that you took that course sometime in September, October time frame 2002? Correct. Okay, when's the next one? Or what's the next course number? Criminal investigation uh, 01160. So that's down towards the bottom of the page? Correct. Criminal investigation? Yes, sir. That would have been April, May 2007. Is that right? I want to say it would have been March or, or April. Actually, that was only a week, so that would have been in April. Okay. How can you tell it was only a week? Well, I remember that it was only uh, one week, sir, and it says right there it's 40 hours. Okay. And what, that's another question I had on this thing is, uh, when it has under the hours column, it has a specific number of hours. I mean, obviously that's the length of the course, right? Yes, sir. And when you take these courses, are they typically all day courses? The, the longer ones, like the basic academy says 760 hours. Was that 760 consecutive hours all day, every day until you were finished? Yes, sir. Okay, and it's the same with respect to these other ones, patrol school and criminal investigations. Yes, sir. Okay. So there's not any, any intervening gap from one day to the next for the coursework? Correct. Okay. Hey, turning over to page 00790, <coughs> if you can let me know which courses reflected there on that page you believe contained um, components that addressed in some way the restrictions based on placed on your power and authority as a law enforcement agent under the Fourth Amendment? Um, 04570. Sexual assault investigations? Yes, sir. And again, that was sometime between September and November 2007? Yes. 40 hours? Yes. So that would have been a one-week course? Yes. Which is, where's the next one? <coughs> Protecting children online. It would have been 09719, and it's halfway down the 
Okay, and that one was sometime between October and December 2008? Yes. 36 hours? Yes, sir. Okay. What does it mean here under the post column when there's a check, uh, check mark in the box there? What does that mean, if you know? I don't remember. Okay. Are there any others on that page that uh, would have contained a warrant or Fourth Amendment component? I don't think so, sir. Okay. And what about the next page? I that, that would be page 00791. I don't think so. Zero zero seven nine two. No, sir. Okay. And what about zero zero seven nine three? Anything there that would have contained a component um, wherein you would have learned about the restrictions, the limitations placed on your powers and authority as a law enforcement agent under the United States Constitution? Sir. Okay, and then turning to page number 00794, same question. Oh, no, sir. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, bum, 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 bum. Now, we've talked a little bit about the Fourth Amendment, the United States Constitution. I want to get some specifics if we can. Do you recall learning specifically what the rules are in relation under the Constitution in relation to your abilities as a law enforcement agent to seize a child from the custody of its parents? Do you remember what the specific rules are that govern your conduct? Um, I would say that if there needs to be immediate uh, danger that the child uh, will suffer um, serious injury or harm uh, or death, and that I may take a child uh, into protective custody without a warrant at that, uh, in a situation like that, mm -hmm. um, if there is uh, consent from the parent. You mean or if there is consent? Or, or yes sir, yeah. or. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure I was clear that you didn't mean to say that you need both an immediate danger and consent. No sir, it only would be or. Okay. Or mm -hmm. with a warrant, sir. Okay, and were you finished with your answer again? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, well, that, it is my understanding that, that with that, those are my restrictions, that I would need a warrant um, without a warrant, I would need exigent circumstances or consent. Okay. Can we do this if you guys don't mind? Because uh, I just need a big, big cup of coffee and I need to go to the restaurant. Sure. Okay, we are going off the record. The time is 10.52. We are going back on the record. The time is 11 o'clock. Okay. I'm going to show you what we will mark as exhibit number 98 to your deposition. Yes, sir. Sir, <laughs> sir and can I, um, can I just add in regards to the transcripts from my training? Sure. So, I mean, I think it's common sense, so I'm thinking to myself that I know it was a long time ago, but if, if I have anything to do with force or when it refers to, like, for example, the um, racial profiling, yes, mm -hmm. it would apply to, at some point, they would have mentioned the, the Fourth Amendment. Okay. What about the Fourteenth Amendment? Um, in regards, to when it comes to use of force? Well, no, when it comes to any of your trainings that you've had, do you, do you recall having any training whatsoever specific to the proscriptions that arise under the 14th Amendment that restrict in some way your powers as a law enforcement agent? Yes, I'm sure I had training on that. Okay. <clears throat>
Now, looking at really quick exhibit number 98. Do you recognize that document at all? Not specifically. Do you know whether or not that is a depiction of the training materials that would have been associated with the um, child abuse investigations training that we saw on exhibit number 53? I don't remember specifically this, um, I guess, this training material, but the, or the actual, um, what would you call this? PowerPoint. PowerPoint. But I do, like, the information would have been information they, they covered in the class. Okay. I don't think I have an extra copy, but everybody should have it from uh, Officer Lee's deposition. Hopefully I'll brought your stuff with you. But I'm going to show you in my exhibit book, the exhibit marked number 97. And you can take a moment to kind of flip through that if you like. <coughs> You guys will. I mean, you do have it actually because it's in the uh, no, no, disclosures. I'm here right now. Because right, right. Have right. It's our practice to pre-mark everything and then just give it up on a DVD before we even start all this stuff. What exactly is that exhibit number 97? Um, so this is this would have been a PowerPoint for um, for a child abuse class. Was uh, that the PowerPoint presented to you in relation to the child abuse investigation class depicted on exhibit number 53? I don't remember specifically, sir. But I mean, some of the material would have been covered in that class. Okay. Well, let me ask you this: that class it was 40 40 hours long, correct? Yes. So that would have been an entire work week? Yes. Okay. And there were many different components to that class, correct? Yes. It's your recollection that one of those components addressed the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and how it applies to restrict your powers and authority as a law enforcement agent in the context of child abuse investigations, correct? That I recall, yes, sir. Okay. Did you also have a component in that course, that 40-hour uh, course, that um, taught you about how the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution applies to restrict your powers and authority as a law enforcement agent in the context of child abuse investigations? Um, I, I would think it did. I mean, I don't remember specifically, but I would say it, it would. Okay. 
in either of those subparts of that 40-hour course, do you recall there being a PowerPoint presentation relative to that subject matter, that is the subject matter of how the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution apply to restrict your powers as a law enforcement agent? I don't remember a PowerPoint, sir. Okay. How did, describe for me how these courses went. Were they lecture? Were they, I mean, how did it go? How was it presented, this material in this 40-hour course? Um, well, they vary. I mean, I don't remember specifically, for example, this one. I know sometimes they, there's the presenter, they, they just stand up there and, and kind of ask questions and have the, the audience um, participate, or they, there's PowerPoints. Um, I, I think sometimes we do, or they have like where the students, they, they get into small groups and they interact and mm -hmm. run through a scenario. I'm not okay. specific. Are there always some kind of written materials associated with those subparts of courses though? I can't say always. I wouldn't say always, but, but, I'm but mostly. most of the time, yes. Okay. So when you say that you don't remember um, there being written materials or a PowerPoint presentation specifically related to the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment and how they might apply to restrict your authority and powers as a law enforcement agent in the context of a child abuse investigation, you're not saying that there aren't any such documents. You're just saying you don't remember one way or the other, right? Correct, sir. Before coming here today, did you undertake any effort at all yourself to locate training documents relative to how the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments might apply in some way to restrict your authorities, your powers as a law enforcement agent in the context of child abuse investigations? Did you yourself undertake any effort to locate responsive documents? Would that be documents that are mine, that I had in my possession from training, or I'm not sure? Well, you, you work at the agency, right? Yes, sir. There's somebody there that, for example, if you missed a training or you didn't remember exactly, you could have asked them, hey, can I see that, right? Yes. Okay. Did you do something like that here when you were looking for documents responsive to our requests? Did you do anything to locate responsive documents? I, if you mean, I'm, for example, I looked at my, I verified that I had um, one of the, the warrant manuals that I use. Did you bring that with you? Yes, it's in my car. Okay, let's take a break. Do you want to go get it? Sure. Okay. We are going off the record. The, the, the time is 11.09. We are going back on the record. The time is 11.28. All right, we took a break so that you could go down to your car and retrieve documents that uh, you brought with you to your deposition but left in your car. The only document that you returned here with was a book titled Search Warrant Manual 2013 Edition. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, can I get a quick picture of this thing? Just zoom in on it. Thanks. Okay. Um, I have requested of counsel that we be provided a copy of this document. Um, she's represented that she wants us to serve her a formal request because it's her position that this document is not responsive in any way to the request for production that were served attendant to the deposition notice here. Have I stated that correctly so far? That's correct. 
Okay. You're not saying that you won't produce to us a copy of the manual. What you're saying is that you want us to serve you a formal request for the manual. Is that correct? I'm saying that you can serve a formal request and we will evaluate and respond appropriately. I'm not saying either way whether it will be produced. Okay. Let me do this. Let's go off the record just for a moment. We are going off the record. The time is 1130. We are going back on the record. The time is 11.34. Okay, I briefly looked through the index and the table of contents in the warrant search warrant manual that you brought with you here today. Is there a reason you brought that with you today? Um, well, I was trying to bring out stuff that I knew, like sometimes I, I would consult when it comes to warrants. Okay. When it comes to warrant issues, that's one of the documents, that book that you had here was one of the documents that you would normally consult? Um, yeah. I mean, that would be something I would look up if I'm not familiar with some, with like okay. an investigation or something that I'm doing that I need to write a warrant. Okay. You're aware through your training that hospital holds are seizures under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment, correct? I guess I would say yes. Okay, and that's based on your training and experience with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department? Yes. Okay. And since hospital holds are seizures under the 4th and 14th Amendments, unless there is an emergency, is it your understanding, based on your training, nothing more, that they also um, fall under the warrant requirements imposed by the 4th and 14th Amendments? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Can I have it rewritten, please? And since hospital holds are seizures under the 4th and 14th Amendments, unless there is an emergency, is it your understanding based on your training, nothing more, that they also fall under the warrant requirements imposed by the 4th and 14th Amendments? Yes. Okay. Have you ever gotten a hospital, or have you ever gotten a warrant to place a hospital hold on a child? I have not. You have not. If you were called upon to do that, where would you look to get the information that you needed in order to know what to do, what steps to take to get such a warrant? I would look at the at the policy um, in regards to getting a warrant for that. Yeah. To place a child in protective custody. Um, I mean, I follow pro I follow policy. When you say place a child into protective custody, what you're talking about there is actually seizing the child, right? What do you mean? Let me ask it this way. When you say taking the child into protective custody, what exactly does that entail? What do you mean? Well, it doesn't mean that necessarily, like for example, a hospital hold, I'm not removing that child from the hospital, but I am, I am um, placing them under protective custody, therefore uh, they, they're not allowed to be released to the parents. That child is not allowed to be released to the parents. Okay, and you understand that when you do that, you impose that requirement that the child cannot be released to the parents, you understand that that is a seizure of the child from the parents, correct? Yes. Okay, so when you say taking the child into protective custody, you mean you're interfering with the parents' rights to that child, right? Correct. And that's a seizure? Yes. Okay, so protective custody equals seizure, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I understand nobody likes to use the word seizure just because it sounds bad. Protective custody sounds better. But it's I just want to make it pretty clear today that when we talk about protective custody, what we're talking about is a seizure of a child from its parents. You yes. with me? Yes, sir. I do understand that. It's just okay. that it's a term that I, I use. Sure, sure. I get that. That's okay. So 
if you're in a situation where you're contemplating whether or not you should seize the child with or without a warrant, do you reference at all your warrant manual that you brought here with you today? Or is that a source you would reference? Calls for speculation and complete hypothetical. Just based <coughs> on your own training experience and knowledge of what's in that manual. Same objections. I guess it would depend on the, the actual investigation I'm conducting mm -hmm. and whether or not I'm in, I am familiar with the type of, um, I guess, warrant I would write or, or, or just to consult with, with, yeah, with the book. So if it was a situation that you weren't familiar with, then you would consult that book to get, potentially get information to guide you? Misstates testimony calls for speculation. And if I'm misstating anything, please let me know, because I don't want to put anything, any words in your mouth at all. Well, for example, if I were investigating a case where I'm not familiar or I have questions in regards to the procedures, um, I would either consult with that book or consult with uh, a partner or consult the department policy mm -hmm. and procedures. Okay. Are you familiar with how to go about getting a warrant to seize a child from the custody of its parents while the child's at the hospital? I've never done it. Are you familiar, though, was my question. Are you familiar with how that would be done? Um, I would, I'm going to get, say yes. I, I, I have never done it, but I'm going to say that I would just do, do it as I would do any other uh, search warrant. Okay. And in that process, is that something that you might uh, go back and reference your search warrant manual for to get more details? Incomplete hypothetical on calls for speculation. Go ahead. I guess I would. Okay. And what about the situation where we're not talking about a hospital, we're off somewhere now, maybe at a grandparent's house or the parent's home, school maybe, and you're, you're in a situation where you're not sure, should I get a warrant or should I seize the kid right now? Is that a situation under which you might also go back and review that manual that you brought here with you today? Incomplete hypothetical, calls for speculation. It's also vague, overbroad, and compound. Go ahead. I think it would depend on the situation. For example, if the child is an immediate uh, risk of suffering, bodily harm or death, then I don't even consider a warrant. I, mm -hmm. I, would, I would take that child into protective custody. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Well, let's say you're out in the field and it's not clear. It's a wobbler. You're not sure if it's immediate danger or if you should get a warrant. Is that something that you would go reference your manual for? Incomplete hypothetical calls for speculation. I'm not sure exactly, sir, that I would reference you might, you're just not sure you would. I might, yes. Yeah, okay, so that, that manual actually is a source of a vast amount of information for you in relation to the process by which to obtain warrants, the circumstances under which you might need to get a warrant, stuff like that, right? Correct. Okay, and that would include warrants to seize children from their parents or war warrants to you know, seize a child at the hospital. It would include those types of warrants, right? I haven't consulted in regards to those specific situations to the manual, but I, I would assume that it's a warrant manual, so yes. Okay. And that's one of the reasons you brought it here with you today, and, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number A to your deposition. The notice of a deposition, I only have one copy. I assume everybody brought their own. Have you seen that document before Exhibit A? You know what, I think I gave you mine. Let's switch. Oh no, you know what? I do have one extra copy. Okay, that Exhibit A, have you seen that document before? Yes. Okay. When's the last time you saw it? Um, probably a couple of days ago, maybe last week. 
Yeah, when was the first time that you saw it? I don't remember, sir. It might have been a couple months ago. Okay. When you first saw it, do you recall actually reading it? Yes. Did you understand everything you read? Uh, for the most part, I think so. Okay. And did you have an opportunity as to those parts you did not understand? Did you have an opportunity to clarify them so that you knew what they were asking for? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to page four in the lower right-hand corner of mark number four. It's the page that's titled Request for Production. Do you see that? Yes, sir. See Request for Production number three there says any and all policies, procedures, memorandums, training presentations, or other documents similarly named that re you receive while employed by the County of Los Angeles relating to investigations of allegations of child abuse or neglect in, con in conjunction with social workers. First of all, did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. When you read it, did you understand it? I believe so. What steps, if any, did you take to locate documents responsive to that request number three? Um, I mean, I I looked at the like the policies and and uh, procedures that we have mm -hmm. in the department, which mm -hmm. is which um, which are the ones that are accessible to any deputy. Mm -hmm. um, did you find any when you did that review? Did you find any documents that were responsive to request number three? Uh, yes, sir. Well, they're, they're the ones that the, um, they're in the packet. What packet? And when I say packet, I mean there's a couple of policies printed out that I know I reviewed. Okay. What specific policies were those? Um, I don't remember the top of my head, but I know it had to do with the uh, Suspected Child Abuse Reporting Act. Um, The information that's provided in the Special Victims Bureau, and they, we have a website, and that's mm -hmm. updated. I'm not sure how often, mm -hmm. and it has a um, it's it's a guideline of what to do when dealing with child abuse investigations. Mm -hmm. Did you print any of those out? You reviewed them, but did you print any of those out? Um, no, sir. But you did review them, right? Yes. Okay. What about training presentations? That's just policies that you've talked about so far, right? Yes, sir. What about training presentations? Well, I don't have anything on, uh, for person. I don't keep the training presentations just because I know that the Bureau will hold or the department holds um, records like they have records mm -hmm. of the attending that of the training that we've attended. Okay, and you have the ability if you wanted to to ask somebody though for a copy of that training material? Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, did you do that in this case when you were searching for responsive documents? Did you ask somebody, hey, can I get a copy of this or that training? Uh, no, sir. Is there a reason why not? Um, I was under the understanding that that would have been provided um, through the attorneys. When you received this notice of deposition, did you look at page two? Yes, I'm sure I did. And was it your understanding in reading page two that you were being requested to bring responsive documents with you to the deposition? Yes. Is there a re you had that understanding that, that we we're asking you to bring these with you to, to the deposition? Yes. Is there a reason you did not bring responsive documents with you to the deposition? Well, I see that you have copies of them, sir. Um, so I All thought that them? that's, um, well, yes, you, I mean, I would think that you have everything that the attorneys have provided to you. Why would you think that? Calls for attorney-client communication. Let me ask this a different way. Did somebody tell you not to bring responsive documents with you here today? Calls for attorney-client communication. Other than your attorney? No, sir. Okay. The only person that you spoke with in relation to coming the, to this deposition here today was your attorney and I presume your supervisor, is that right? Yes, I notified my supervisor. Okay. Did your supervisor tell you not to bring any responsive documents? No, sir. Okay. 
but you still somehow have the impression that you did not need to bring any documents with you. Misstates testimony and calls for attorney-client communication. Am I correct that sitting here today you had the impression that you did not need to bring documents responsive to our request with you to your deposition today? Uh, correct, sir. Okay. I don't care where you got that understanding, just so we're all clear on that. If you can look at request for production number one. You see that? It's on page four, top of the page. Yes, sir. It says, any and all documents that you reviewed in preparation for this deposition. Did I read that correctly? Yes, sir. You told me already you reviewed some policies in preparation for the deposition, right? Yes, sir. You didn't bring any of those with you? Correct. Okay, and you don't remember specifically what they were? Policy name, policy number, you don't remember specifically what they were? No, sir. Okay. What about training? Any training? Did you review any training at all relative to the requests here? No. Okay. What about uh, procedures? Did you review any warrant procedures or any procedures that you might need to follow in the context of child abuse investigations? Um, I reviewed some of the material in the search warrant manual. Oh, that manual that you brought here with you today? Yes. You did review that? Yes. Okay, so that would be responsive to request for production number one? Since yeah. you reviewed it? Yes. Okay, I'm going to reiterate my request, counsel. I want a copy of that manual. Are you still refusing? Uh, did you review the entire manual in preparation for your deposition? No. Did, did you, you review portions of the manual? Yes. Which portions did you review? Uh, the names of the warrants um, or the methods in which we can obtain warrants. I can agree to produce what she reviewed for the deposition. All right, we're going to argue about that. We'll file a motion if we're not able to reach an accord. That's fine. Okay, let's take a break. Let's go ahead and get copies of the portions you're going to produce here today. Okay, we are going off the record. The time is 11.50. We are going back on the record. This is the beginning of disc number two. The time is 12.10. Okay, before we went off the record, you had identified for us at least a portion of the warrant handbook that you recall reviewing in preparation for your deposition. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And in front of you there is a little pile of documents that we have marked as exhibit number 102 to your deposition. You see that? Yes. Is that the entirety of the materials that you reviewed from your warrant handbook? in preparation for your deposition here today? Yes, sir. Okay. In looking through that, I've only had a chance, now that it's been produced, to look at it briefly here today at the deposition. Um, I don't see anything in here that relates specifically to obtaining a warrant or the circumstances under which you would be required to obtain a warrant before seizing a child from the custody of its parents. Am I right about that? Correct. Okay. Did you find anything in your search for responsive documents? Did you find anything, whether it be a policy statement, a procedure, uh, training materials, memorandum, did you find anything that related in any way under, under this, to the circumstances under which you would re be required to obtain a warrant before seizing a child in the context of a child abuse investigation? That, that was kind of a long question. It was, sir. I'm trying to think. Let me let me have her reread it. Please. I may end up fixing it if I if I don't understand it either. Okay. Did you find anything in your search for responsive documents? Did you find anything, whether it be a policy statement, a procedure, training materials, memorandum? Did you find anything that related in any way under the to the circumstances under which you would be required to obtain a warrant before seizing a child in the context of a child abuse defense investigation? That's the question. Let me rephrase it because it looks like you might be struggling with it. I kind of struggled with it in the first two. It's just, it's, it's long, sir. Yeah. Okay, you, you did conduct a diligent search for documents responsive to what we were requesting that you bring here today, right? Yes, sir. And that included a search of policies and procedures, yes? Yes. And you also searched for maybe training or no? Uh, I did not search for the, the training okay. records. 
So there may have been some training prep uh, presentations, but you don't know because you didn't look for those. Well, well, I did look, but I didn't have anything. I know I don't have anything in my possession where I hold record of my training. Right, and, and you didn't ask anybody in the office, like a training officer or anybody else, to give you access to that training, right? Correct, sir. Okay. What about other documents? Did you search for other documents that would be responsive to what we were asking you to bring here today? Whether it be a memo, an email, a note on a notepad? I did not have any other documents. Okay, so you did search, but you didn't locate any? Correct. Okay. So the only thing you located that was responsive to our request number three was, what's that chapter number there on 102? I chapter 9 of your warrant handbook? And just to clarify, before we went off the record, I think it was responsive to number one. Sure. So I don't know that she's testified, you know, about that. I have my question reread. Sure. And then we'll get an answer to it. The only thing you located that was responsive to our request number three was, what's that chapter number there in, on 102? Chapter nine of your warrant handbook? Is that right or wrong? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm correct. Yes, this is the only thing that I located okay. in regards to okay. documents. Do you know as you sit here today, well, wait a minute, you've been with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, I think you said since 97, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's like 21 years? Yes. Okay. In your entire 21 years with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, um, do you recall being trained that as a law enforcement agent, you cannot lawfully remove a child from the custody of its parents unless at the time of the removal, that is at the time of the seizure, you are in possession of specific articulable facts to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death and there is no lesser intrusive way to prevent the specific injury. Have you learned that? Yes, sir. Okay. When is the last time that you learned that? give you a specific time frame or a date or the actual training um, okay. because our training is ongoing we'll receive like newsletters or uh, the field um, operation directives uh, we, we get stuff all the time in the email so I'm not okay. exactly sure okay did you also learn in your training, and I, I'm not going to try to pin you down on the timing of the training because it sounds like it's ongoing training your entire time with the career, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm not going to worry about the timing. But in your training, in your 22 years, I guess 21 years with the Sheriff's Department, have you also learned that your decision to seize a child has to be based on the information that you have available at the moment in time that you seize the child. It can't be stuff that you develop later on. Correct. Okay. Have you also learned that a, um, when you're making the decision whether or not to detain a child in a situation where there's more than one child in the family, they're siblings, that you have to do an independent assessment regarding the safety of each child in relation to each parent. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to ask you when you learned that, but... <coughs> well, actually, I am going to ask you. Do you remember just generally, and I know you're not going to be able to give me a specific date, maybe a year, that would be fine. Do you remember generally what year it was that you were first trained that concept? That, that is that you have to make an individualized assessment as to each child in relation to each parent. <clears throat> I, I can't 
tell you when I learned that, sir. I, I, I went out to patrol in 2002, which is when I started dealing with uh, cases with child abuse, so I'm not sure exactly when. So maybe as early as 2002. You're just not sure. I'm just not sure. Okay. Do you do you recall whether or not you've seen those concepts? The last several questions I've asked you. Do you recall whether or not you've seen those concepts presented in a um, in materials and training materials that you received during the various trainings you've had over the last ten years or so? I don't remember specifically, but I know that when we, when I received training, for example, for the child abuse, and they cover the um, welfare institution, the WIC codes for the children, I know that that would be something they would have mentioned. But would I that have been that 2014 training that we saw in Exhibit 53? It could have been. Then. If, if it helps you. Uh, in your recollection as to the timing, feel free to look at Exhibit 53, Exhibit 54. Well, they did, I know that they did cover the 300 sections, so I would say that back in, in when I had that child abuse investigation, they, they would have covered it. Okay. Did you also learn during your training, whether it's that particular training or some other training, did you also learn that the unwarranted seizure of a child is presumptively unlawful? Do you mean like unjustified or without a warrant? Oh, I'm sorry. I can see how you would think that. Let, let me just try rephrasing. That's probably a poorly framed question. Did you learn in your trainings that the seizure of a child from its parents without a warrant is presumptively unlawful? Um. I don't think that's correct. I think that I learned that we have to evaluate every investigation and every situation is different. So I, I don't, I wouldn't say that that's what I learned. So you've never heard in any of your training that the seizure of a person without a warrant is presumptively unlawful and the burden rests on the seizing officer to show there was an exigent circumstance justifying the seizure. You've never been trained that? Maybe I'm misunderstanding you. Well, I mean, I know that I cannot just go and, and take a child and protective, into protective custody without having um, evidence that there is exigent circumstances that this child is in immediate, da is in immediate danger. Okay. I know that. Okay. I'm not sure if that's what Wait, you're asking. I, I think it is, just in a different way. I, I just want to pin down and make sure I'm understanding correctly that you've never actually been trained that the seizure of a child without a warrant, there is a presumption that that seizure is unreasonable and the, the burden is on you, the seizing officer, to show that no, it's not unreasonable, I had an exigent circumstance. I, I guess in those words that you're putting it up, not, not specifically in that verbiage, but I have been trained that I do have to articulate why I'm seizing that child or why I'm Placing that child into protective custody. Okay. I can't just go and, and take the child. You can't just go do home. it. Correct, sir. Right. And in, in articulating the reasons why you're taking a child into protective custody or seizing a child without first getting a warrant, am I correct? We've talked about this a little bit, but I just want to make sure the context. Am I correct that in making that assessment, that's where you have to assess the circumstances of each child individually in relation to each parent individually. Correct. Okay. And the reason for all of that, you understand, is because parents and children have a constitutional right to live together without governmental interference. Am I right about that? Yes, sir. And that constitutional right, according to your training, is protected. It's a protected liberty interest under both the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment. Correct. Yeah. Am I also correct that uh, 
in order for a situation to be considered exigent, at least according to your training, you must have documentable factual information to indicate the child is in immediate danger of serious bodily harm and the seizure is reasonably necessary to avert that specific injury. Yes. Okay. You don't remember when you had that training, do you? I, I don't remember, sir. I mean, okay. it's been a while. And then when we talk about the definition of the term imminent, like imminent danger, what that means is an immediate real threat to a child's life or health. Yes. Okay. And when we're making that assessment, and all this is just according to your training, I don't want you to, if, if you get in a situation where I ask you a question and you're guessing, please don't do that. If, if, it, if you don't recall it or you have a vague recollection, let me know. Okay, I just want to make sure exactly what we're doing here. Yes, sir. So, now I lost my train of thought. Can I get my last question and her answer reread, please? Well, not the immediately last, because her last was yes, sir, and the admonition. So. assessment and all this is just according to your training I don't want you to if you get in a situation before that before that and then when we talk about the definition of the term imminent like imminent danger what that means is an immediate real threat to a child's life or health answer yes okay and when we're talking about articulable evidence to show there's a immediate real threat to the child's life or health what that means, according to your training again, is that we can't guess or speculate. We can't seize a child based on hunches, right? We have to have specific articulable evidence. Yes, I okay. would say, and in, 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 it would depend, yes, on the, the investigation. Okay, but you're, you're not entitled to speculate, right? Right, I cannot speculate. Yeah, and you can't act on a hunch, like you just have a feeling little, you know, hairs on the back of your neck stand up and say, gee whiz, I, I think there's something going on here. I'm going to seize the kid. You can't do that. No. Okay. No, I'm right or no, you can't do that? I cannot do that. Okay. Correct. That, in fact, that would be unlawful, according to your training. It would be unlawful for me to go on it based on a hunch, yes. Yeah, or a speculation. Or a speculation, yes, sir. That, that's why you're trained to need specific articulable facts to show the immediate severe bodily injury, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And all of that, that assessment, again, that has to be done in relation to each child and each parent, right? Correct, sir. And the reason that these rules are in place is to safeguard the constitutional rights of both the parent and the child. Is that right? Yes. And that's according to your training? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, one, one other thing, while we're talking about this, you know, assessment for exigent circumstances, am I correct that you have to first undertake a reasonable investigation before making the decision to seize a child without first obtaining a warrant? Have you been trained that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. yeah. Now, one other thing while we're talking about this, you know, assessment for exigent circumstances, am I correct that you have to first undertake a reasonable investigation before making the decision to seize a child without first obtaining a warrant? Have you been trained now? Yes. And I, we've already covered this a little bit, but I want to hit it again because it's in my book. With respect to hospital holds, you've been trained that hospital holds are a form of seizure that may require obtaining a warrant. Is that right? I have been trained that hospital holds are 
um, our seizures. And that they, all the normal Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment warrant requirements restricting your authority and power would apply. Correct, yes. Yeah. So all that stuff, I don't need to go talk about, you know, the exigent circumstances and all that stuff, again, in relation to hospital holds, correct? Because that all applies. Correct, it would all apply. Am I correct? Have, have you learned in your training that, um, and this is in respect to not exigent circumstances, but consent. Am I correct that in obtaining consent, say you're uh, trying to get consent from a parent to remove their child, am I correct that it would be unlawful for you to make threats to the parent or caregiver in order to gain uh, their cooperation or compliance. You're correct. Okay. And when we talk about making threats to gain compliance being unlawful, am I correct that saying something like, either give me the child or you're going to jail, that would be an unlawful threat? Incomplete hypothetical. Just according to your training. Correct. Okay. Circumstance like that where the caregiver uh, say refuses, say, says, no, I'm not going to give you my child. Unless there's an emergency right then and there that places the child in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death, you would have to get a warrant. You can't threaten them. Just according to your training and your experience, actually. I'm thinking about the scenario. If I understand your question, is that you're you're at, you're at, you're asking me if it's unlawful if I want or if I coerced a parent into giving me the child by threatening them? Yeah. Or if that would be unlawful. Same objections. Okay. I'm sorry. Your answer was. It, it's unlawful. Okay. And you you've <coughs> been trained that, and based on your 21 years of experience with the sheriff's department, it's your understanding that if a parent or a caregiver refuses to give up custody of the child and there is no exigent circumstance, you still have to get a warrant. You can't threaten them. Right, so there, I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't know if, I'm, I'm not going to threaten a parent, uh, if whether I have a warrant or, I mean, if I, like I'm trying to think of the situation that you're telling well, me, sir. Let's go back, because maybe there's a little misunderstanding here. Maybe I misunderstood you. In order to lawfully seize a child from the custody of its parent, you either have to have a warrant. Correct. Yes. yes. Consent. Yes. Or exigent circumstances. Correct. 
So it's disjunctive. You don't have to have all three, right? Correct. Okay. So what I'm asking you is we're at, we have a situation where we have a caregiver that has custody of a child. You would still have to either have a warrant, consent, or exigent circumstance to take that child, correct? Correct. We have I'm sorry, your answer again? Correct. Okay. So let's narrow it down a little bit just to the issue of consent since, since we know this is a disjunctive test. Okay. Okay. When we're looking at the issue of consent, again, the same situation, we have the caregiver who has custody of the child, there's no <coughs> warrant, and there's no specific articulable evidence to show an immediate danger to the child. So we're just looking at consent. You with me? Yes. Is it unlawful for the officer or the, the agent to say words to the effect of, give me the child or you're going to jail? The hypothetical calls for speculation. Join also calls for the legal conclusion. Just based on your training. I'm not looking for guesses or legal <coughs> conclusions. Based on your understanding of your training. Do you need a question you read? I would say it's unlawful. Yeah. I would too. I'm with you. Is that a question? No, it's a comment. Okay. I like to comment. You I should know. do that. Am I correct also that you've learned in your training that if you do seize a child and you believe you do have those specific articulable facts showing that the child is you know, going to suffer immediate and severe bodily injury or death, that you have to document those facts, those specific articulable facts. You have to write them down somewhere. Correct. Okay. And when you write those facts down somewhere, you're required to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete. Is that right? Yes. Where would you normally write down those facts that would support your claim of exigent circumstances? Well, it, they would be documented in the police report. Or a supplemental report. Or a supplemental, yeah, yes, a supplemental report. Okay. Did you also learn in your training that the severity of an injury to a child standing alone does not provide exigent circumstances? Correct. I would say that it would have to be a, a series of, of uh, facts that I've obtained through my investigation. Okay. So for, for example, you have a child in the hospital, let's say suffering a serious brain injury. The nature of that injury alone is not sufficient basis to remove the child without first obtaining a warrant or getting something to show he's in immediate danger. Again, based on her training? Of course. The sole... Um, the, the fact that the child has a head injury is not the sole reason for me to mm -hmm. place the child into protective custody mm -hmm. or place a hold. Okay. And in fact... My understanding? Yeah, question. yeah, no, your understanding. You, you, yes. In fact, unless you have a specific, you know, evidence, specific articulable evidence to draw a causal link between the injury and a perpetrator, you would still need to get a warrant. Calls for a legal conclusion, just incomplete hypothetical, calls for speculation. Just Sorry. according to your training. All of this, these questions are just according to your understanding of your training. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. In fact, unless you have a specific, you know, evidence, specific articulable evidence to draw a causal link between the injury and the perpetrator, you would still need to get a warrant. I join in the objections. I would say that it has to be based on the investigation itself that I'm conducting, the, the, mm -hmm. the other factors. I have, I'd have to consider that. I'm not sure how to answer that. Sure. I, I understand that. That's not really the question, though. The question is, if you're going to seize this child from their parent, just the fact that the child's been injured doesn't mean you have a legal basis to seize the child, right? Asked and answered. Go ahead. Correct. Okay. There has to be some specific articulable evidence to show a link between the parent's conduct and the injury to the child, correct? Cost of legal conclusion. Join. That, that would be something, yes, that would be one of the factors I would consider, yes. Okay. 
And it's the same standard, though. You would have to have specific, articulable facts to establish that link, that causal link. Yes, sir. Okay, you can't speculate or guess or have hunches. Correct. Okay. And if you did just guess or speculate and seize the child according to your training and your understanding of your training without that causal link, that would be unlawful. Yes. Am I correct according to your training that the warrant requirements arising under the 4th and 14th Amendments protect individual family members, 4th Amendment rights against unreasonable searches and seizures, as well as the parents and children's 14th Amendment right to live together without governmental interference and thus not to be separated by the state without due process of law? It's compound, it's vague, it calls for legal conclusion. Do you recall that from your training? Joy. That's the question. Do you recall that from your training? Verbatim, no, but yes, I do I do recall being trained on that. Okay. You remember you recall the concept? Yes, sir. Okay. You just not the specific words that I just gave you. Correct, sir. Okay. And part of the reason for that is the last time you had that particular sort of training would have been in two thousand fourteen. Is that right? Mr. Mm, testimony calls for speculation. The last time that I specifically remember being trained on on that um, would have been in 2014, but I may have attended other um, informal training. Okay. So you have both formal and informal training on this subject matter? Uh, on different matters, sir. Yes. show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 89. Let me get this out of the way. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 89 to your deposition. And let me make sure this is not front to back. Yeah, this is front to back. They're all front to back. Well, unfortunately, I only have two copies, so that's, these are the ones we're going to use. Yes, sir. Exhibit number 89. You guys should have them on your computers because both County of LA and we produced it to you. Are, are, is it identified by Bates numbers? Uh, it's not. It looks like it was something that might have been produced at the Perez deposition, just because it has a sticker on it. But whatever it is, it's exhibit number 89. And I don't know that I'm going to have a lot of um, questions for you about the content. What I really want to know is, is this one of those policy documents that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition here today? No, sir. Does it look like it? Do you remember the names of the policies that you did review in preparation for your deposition here today? I don't remember the names. I know that one of the one of the, um, the documents I reviewed was the actual the guidelines that we have in the um, Special Victims Bureau website, and it talks about the 300 code and procedures in taking ch uh, children into protective custody. Do you know what Bates range that would be, Megan? Not off the top of my head, but it would have a Bates range. And during a break, 
perhaps I can pull it up and we can figure it out. Okay, that's fair. But you're certain that that document, Exhibit 89, is not one that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition? Correct, sir. Okay. I want to retract it then and not attach it to the transcript because it's a lot of pages. And if she hasn't reviewed it, it's kind of meaningless for me. Am I correct that the policies that you did review, those guidelines off the uh, Special Victims Unit website, they would have contained information um, relating to the procedures you would need to follow to obtain a warrant or court order in relation to seizing a child from the custody of its parents. Am I right? No. Um. <coughs> The, what I remember is they, it discussed um, placing a child, placing a hold on a child if the child is in the hospital. And that was, and the guidelines are for um, field personnel to follow. I think I know what you're talking about. I just had something like that in front of me. Let me show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 96 to your deposition and see if that might be what you're talking about. Do you recognize that, exhibit number 96? Yes, sir. What is exhibit number 96? It's the printout for Special Victims Bureau, um, and this is what is found on the internet. For in order for deputies can access this. Okay. Is this the document you were referencing just a little while ago when you said that you reviewed this on the intranet? Yes, sir. Okay. And just for the record, it's exhibit number 96, Bates numbered pages 00976 through and including 00978. Did you review any documents other than this one? relative to the circumstances under which you might be required to get a warrant before seizing a child from the custody of its parents? Not that I remember, sir, no. Okay. And in conducting your search and review of documents, respo or responsive documents, um, were there any documents besides this one that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition? So aside from this one, I did, I reviewed um, the um, suspected child abuse reporting uh, procedures. Okay, the suspected child abuse reporting procedures, though, those relate to your obligation to cross-report, right? Correct, sir. Okay, those don't relate to the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant, correct? Co correct, sir. Okay. The only document, and I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, I don't want to put words in your mouth, the only document that you were able to locate that related in some way to the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant was this exhibit number 96. In the state's testimony. If I'm wrong, let me know where I'm wrong. Um, well, this and then um, there is, I, I mean, I think so, sir. I mean, I, I don't remember specifically because I reviewed other stuff like the police reports, um, so I don't remember specifically what other well let's let's do this you reviewed other documents besides exhibit number 96 I think you just said that yes sir okay you also reviewed the suspected child abuse reporting guidelines yes okay you also reviewed the police reports the Correct. supplemental reports yes sir okay you also reviewed at least a portion of your warrant search warrant handbook correct okay what else did you review? Um, also the actual complaint itself 
in my responses. What do you mean the complaint? Um, the, uh, I mean, I guess I would call it a complaint. Oh, the or what I was supposed to, my responses to the discovery and my responses to. Um, so that's exhibit A? I'm not sure what this is, sir. Uh, yes, A. Yeah, that would be the notice of deposition. What else did you review? Uh, the other documents that had has that have to do with the deposition, my my responses. Uh, does that sound like maybe interrogatories or requests yes. for admissions? Yes, sir. Okay. What else? I think that's it. That's it. I believe so. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to go through the list because my question as to Exhibit Number Ninety Six is very specific. It relates to documents describing for you the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant. Are you with me? I think so. Okay. The suspected child abuse guideline or reporting guidelines, that doesn't relate to the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from its parents, does it? No, I don't think so. Okay. The police reports, supplemental police reports, those don't describe for you the circumstances under, wi under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant, correct? Correct. Okay. The search warrant handbook, same thing. That did, at least the portion you reviewed, did not lay out for you any specifics or details about the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant, correct? Correct. The Exhibit A, the Notice of Deposition from my office, we don't lay out there for you any information about the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant, right? Correct. Okay. Can I just clarify something? Just, yeah. Just for the record, she said that she reviewed the complaint and, and held that up, I think, indicating the caption. So yeah, we, we, that's why I identified it as okay. Exhibit I just, A. I just, but, no, but her, the notice of her deposition is Exhibit A, yeah. but she said that she reviewed the complaint in this case and was looking at the caption. So uh, I just want to clarify that. So I think she did review, she testified she reviewed the notice. She also testified she reviewed the complaint in this case. That's, we'll, what, she, that's what I heard she was saying. We'll add that to the end. That's just fine. to make sure we have, I thought I clarified that, maybe not. Yeah. Okay, the request for admissions that you responded to, I think you said that you reviewed those in preparation for your complaint or yes, for sir. your deposition. Yes. And the, in the request for admissions, that again came from my office, correct? I, I don't remember, sorry. There okay. was so much, there, there were so many documents, but, but it, is, it is what I, was, as far as what I was requested as far as documents to be produced. Okay. That's not the one. I'm going to show you something and maybe that will spark a memory. Maybe not. Sometimes this doesn't work, but it may. Okay, I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number 102 to your deposition. Oh, you know what? We already marked a 102. Oh, nuts. Yeah. Well, we can write Let's on Let's remark this. this one 103. I'll make sure Adrian knows about that. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 103 to your Actually, I need one of those back because I don't think I have a, uh, it's not in my book. Well, sir, I mean, I do recognize this. This is what I read. That's what you responses. read? responses. Okay, excellent. Okay. Now, in, in the plaintiff's request for admissions, we don't lay out there for you anything about the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant, right? Correct. Okay. So I'll go back to my original question. Um, actually, no, there's a complaint. When you said earlier that you reviewed the complaint, what were you referring to? I was actually referring to the, act, um, the, the I guess, the contents of the lawsuit itself. What okay. The, so the, the filing with the court where it laid out what the plaintiffs think you did that was wrong. Correct. Okay. In that complaint, again, that came from my office, 
in that complaint did you see any description at all relating to the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? No, sir. Okay. So I'll go back to the original question now. Am I correct that in your diligent search and reasonable inquiry to find documents uh, to bring with you here to your deposition, the only document that you found that related in any way to the circumstances under which it would be appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant was Exhibit 96. I, I believe so, sir. Okay, thank you for that. Let's take a little break. After. We are going off the record. The time is 12.54. We are going back on the record. The time is 1.31. Okay, ma'am. If you can take a look at exhibit number 96 for me. <clears throat> and I think you identified for me earlier that exhibit number 96 was one of the documents you reviewed in preparation for your deposition, right? Yes, sir. And it was a document that you were able to locate when you were conducting your diligent search of the department's intranet for policies. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So what is this thing? What is, what exactly is exhibit number 96? Um, this is, uh, so this information is located on the Special Victims Bureau website. Um, it's accessed by deputies in the field. And this, for example, if they have a question, if they're in the middle of an investigation, if they have a question, um, instead of calling us immediately, they can refer to this for guidance. Okay, okay. so it's, it's basically for deputies who are out in the field, for them to reference first as a primary resource before they resort to calling you? Uh, correct, sir, or, or, or even I've referred to it before, but okay. yes, but essentially that's what it's for. Okay, and, and here, we've talked a lot this morning or earlier in the day about the circumstances under which it's appropriate to seize a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant. Am I correct that this particular document, exhibit number 96, although not using the exact language we used earlier in the day, um, addresses the same sort of subject, that is, the circumstances under which you can seize a child without getting a warrant? Yes, sir. Okay. And if we look in the upper half of the page on page number 00976, it says right there in that box, you see that box there? Yes, sir. It says uh, California Welfare and Institutions Code 305, any peace officer may, without a warrant, take into temporary custody a minor, this is A, when the off officer has reasonable cause for believing that the minor is a person described in section 300 and in addition that the minor has an immediate need for medical care or the minor is in immediate danger of physical or sexual abuse or the physical environment or the fact the child is left unattended poses an immediate threat to the child's health or safety. First, did I read all that correctly? That's a long sentence. Yes. Okay. You see that and right after section 300? Yes. Is it your understanding that what that means is that in addition to meeting the requirements of section 300, you also have to have specific articulable evidence to show the child's in immediate danger or need of medical care. The document speaks for itself, the code speaks for itself, calls for speculation, and calls for a legal conclusion. I'm just asking for your interpretation as a detective with the Department of uh, the Sheriff's Department, LA County Sheriff's Department. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And yes. that's the way you interpret it as well? That is the way I interpret it. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you go down um, just below the center of the page on page 00976 of exhibit number 96, 
it's the paragraph beginning with the words arresting the suspect does not do you see that yes okay, and it says arresting the suspect does not relieve you of the duty to evaluate the safety of the child keep in mind the child's safety keep in mind the child's safety if the suspect is released from custody due to bail or bond is there a responsible adult in the home who will protect the child first did i read all that correctly yes okay in reading that am i correct that what you're told here your understanding of what you're being told here is that even if you're arresting a suspect you still have to individually assess the safety of the child correct okay you can't just because you're arresting one parent you can't just take the child you have to look at whether or not perhaps another parent or some other caregiver can still take care of the child and protect the child right I agree with what you said, but I think in this, in this particular sentence, it's talking more about just because you arrest a suspect doesn't mean that you don't have to follow up and make sure that child is safe. You have to consider this person coming out. It, let's say, for example, like a physical abuse case, you have to consider mm -hmm. this person coming out, getting bonded out of custody and, um, and having access to that child. Well, I'm not sure. What's this last sentence where it says, is there a responsible adult in the home who will protect the child? What, what does that mean to you? That you do have to assess whether that child does okay. have someone that is going to protect them. Okay, and if there is a responsible adult as to whom there is no evidence they've done anything wrong and there's no evidence that they're not going to protect the child, are you required to leave the child with them? Like the father, for example? It, yes, and I would say in, in each situation, I guess it, every situation is different, but if that parent does have a right to that child, yes, that would be something depending right. on the scenario. Right, and it would be unlawful according to your training and experience, wouldn't it, if you didn't even bother assessing the other parent? You just took the kid and didn't even look at the other parent. That would be unlawful, wouldn't it? Incomplete hypothetical. Calls for speculation and just based also on, incomplete hypothetical. Just based on your training, nothing more. Without me assessing the other option to leave the, with the other parent, mm -hmm. it would be unlawful. Okay. And part of the reason you know that is we talked about this earlier in your training. You learned that the exigency assessment actually has two parts to it, right? There's the part about needing to have specific articulable facts and there's no lesser intrusive alternative way of protecting the child from the specific injury, right? There's two parts to the test. Correct, sir. Okay. And even if there is a danger to the child, if there's a reasonable option to avert that danger, you have to exercise that option, right? Yes. So, for example, where you have a two-parent situation and one parent, you know, maybe they're a suspect, you don't have anything necessarily solid, but maybe they're a suspect, there might be a danger to the kid. You can't just take from the other parent without some kind of evidence to show they're a danger too, can you? No, you, I would assess overall the, the, the situation with both parents, not just one. Uh -huh. And in order to do that, you would lawfully be required to make that assessment before seizing the children, correct? Just according to your training. And just so we're clear, everything today is just according to your training. If you don't know, I don't want you to make conclusions. I just want it based on your training and experience. Can I have the question we read, please? Yes, please. And in order to do that, you would not believe you're required to make that assessment before receiving the children's credit. No, I think that's the right one. Unless she needs the one before for context. Do you yes, need them please. both? Okay. <laughs> so, for example, where you have a two parent situation and one parent, you know, maybe they're a suspect, you don't have anything necessarily solid. Maybe they're a suspect, maybe they might be a danger to the kid. You can't just take 
from the one parent to show some sort of evidence that they're a danger too, can you? Answer no, I would assess over all the situation with both parents, not just one. Question, and in order to do that, you would lawfully be required to make that assessment before seizing the children, correct? Correct. Okay. Have you ever heard the term pre-deprivation due process? Yes, sir. Okay, in what context? I'm trying to remember. I might be able to help you. Was it in the context of the training you had regarding the need to obtain warrants before interfering with somebody's liberty? Pre-deprivation. Well, I remember that it had to do with detaining children um, okay. under the 300 okay. uh, WIC. Do you remember learning that parents, both actually parents and children, have a right under the Constitution to pre-deprivation due process? Yes. Okay. And part of that right would include the warrant requirements if there's no emergency circumstance or consent. I don't remember specifically, but I believe so. Okay. Generally, that's G correct. Generally, sir, yes. Okay. In this particular case, um, what role, if any, did you play in making the decision to seize Bruno and Bruno? I did not have an actual role in making this, the decision on, on either. Okay, what was your role? To assist Detective Perez in her investigation. In what way? In any way she needed. Did she ever consult with you and ask you your opinion about whether or not these children should be seized? No. Did she ever discuss with you whether or not it would be appropriate to maybe go get a warrant? Not that I remember, no, sir. Do, were you present when Miss... Let me ask you this way. Did you ever speak yourself with social worker Todd? No. Were you ever present when Miss Perez spoke with social worker Todd? Not that I recall, sir. What about with uh, Deputy Schmoker? Were you, did you ever speak with him yourself? I didn't speak with him myself. Um, I do remember meeting him at the hospital mm -hmm. at some point when I got there, yes. And were you together with uh, Detective Perez when you met with Deputy Schmoker? I was, but n I don't think I was there the whole time. Okay. At what point in time, and again, you can just give me general time frames. I know this was a while ago and you may not know the exact time. If you do, give me that. What time, at what point in time did you first learn that you would be going out to assist um, Detective Perez in the investigation? I remember that somebody called me and told me that she was getting, uh, that she was responding to the hospital. Regard, regarding a child. Okay. You got the phone call. You don't remember who, who, who phoned you though, right? No, sir. It wasn't Detective Perez. It was somebody else? Correct. Okay. What did you do once you got that phone call? I, I'm pretty sure I called Detective Perez and I volunteered to go with her. Tell me everything you recall about that conversation. I told her that, um, well, I, I must have asked her wh where she was going because um, I wasn't sure what hospital. Uh, and then I know I volunteered to go with her and she did not want me to go with her. She said she didn't need help. Um, but I told her I was meeting her there. And so I waited for her at the hospital. Okay, do you recall roughly what time it was that you got to the hospital? No, sir, it was pretty late. I did get there before her and waited for her in the parking lot. Okay, so you didn't go into the hospital when you got there. You waited for her Correct. outside. Yes, sir. 
And that phone call that you had with her earlier on when you asked her if she needed assistance, do you recall about roughly how long that phone call was? No, I don't think it was long because I knew she had to get ready for her to roll out. Okay. <coughs> do you remember any thing else about the conversation other than you asking her if she needed help and her saying, no, I don't? No. Did she tell you at that point in time that she had already decided to seize both children? No, I don't think so, sir. Did she discuss that subject with you at all before you got to the hospital that night? Uh, no. I knew she was busy doing her own thing. I, I knew she had been at home, so I wasn't, didn't want to bother her. <laughs> So you get down to the hospital, you're in the parking lot, and I, I presume in a marked car? Uh, just a, an unmarked car. Unmarked sir. car, yes, okay. And you're waiting in the parking lot for her to get there. Yes. Right? She arrives. What's the first thing you recall? Um, I met her at, at her car, I believe, because she started getting her stuff to walk into the hospital. Okay. What do you recall of the conversation you had with her at that point in time when you met her at the car? That I wouldn't remember, sir. Even generally? I mean, it would, it would be where we were going, what floor. I'm not exactly sure. Did she say anything to you that you recall at that point in time out in the parking lot when you met her? Did she say anything to you at all about whether or not it was her intention to seize the children? No, I, I don't remember, sir. When was the first time that you discovered that the children were going to be seized from uh, both Rachel and Ricardo? I know at some point in speaking with uh, Deputy Schmoker, the issue was discussed about... What do you mean when you say the issue was discussed? Or the matter of placing the hospital hold. Who brought that up? I, I don't remember, sir. I know it was a discussion that was brought up with Deputy Schmoker, but I'm not sure if he brought it up or she brought it up. Okay. Did you participate in that discussion or were you just sort of there observing? I don't remember specifically participating in it, but I know I was there okay. when it was brought up. Okay. Let me ask you one thing we didn't cover earlier in respect to your training. Did you ever learn in any of your training that as a law enforcement officer you have an affirmative obligation, that is a duty, to intervene and intercede when you observe a citizen's constitutional rights being violated? Calls for speculation, calls for a legal conclusion. It really doesn't. Either she was trained about that or she wasn't. I don't remember specifically. Okay. Um, I, I don't remember specifically. Okay. As you're sitting here, irrespective of whether it was from training or some other source, are you aware that as a law enforcement officer, you have an affirmative obligation to intervene and intercede when you see one of your fellow officers violating someone's constitutional rights? Same objections. I would think it's reasonable. You remember the Rodney King case? Vaguely. Big group of police just beating the snot out of the guy? Yes, sir. The, do you recall whether or not any training arose out of that relative to your affirmative obligation to intervene and intercede when you see a fellow officer violating somebody's constitutional rights? I don't remember specifically. Okay. Is that a concept that you're even vaguely familiar with? That is, the concept being your duty as a law enforcement officer to intervene and intercede to prevent the violation of a citizen's rights when you see one of your fellow officers <coughs> violating their rights. Is that a concept you're even vaguely familiar with? I'm not a concept I'm familiar with, but I, it's, I would think it's common sense. Okay. But you're, you are sure you've never had any training by the County of Los Angeles Sheriff's Department 
relative to your duty to intervene and intercede to prevent the violation of a citizen's constitutional rights by one of your fellow officers. You've never had that training. I, I can't say I have never because I don't remember. I'm having some trouble. You're not familiar with the concept, but it makes sense to you, yet you're not willing to tell me you've never had the training. Well, well because, sir, if you, for example, you gave me the Rodney King scenario, well, if I were there in that similar situation, I would do it out of my moral, um, I guess, principles, but not, not because I'm, I'm aware that as a peace officer I have to do it, it's just because that's the per person that I am. So okay. I guess it's, I'm thinking it's in regards to my ethics. Uh, okay. Well, that, that's, I mean, that's good, and I appreciate that, and I hope someday if you're ever there when I'm getting the snot beat out of me, you'll intervene. But uh, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm really looking for isn't so much your personal view of it as what the county has done formally, officially, to make sure that you and your fellow officers know that you have that duty and obligation under the law. Did they train you? Is there a policy? Is there a procedure that you know about? Not that I remember at this time as I'm sitting here, sir, no. Okay. So you're at this uh, meeting with Detective Perez and Deputy Schmoker, and they're talking about the prospect of seizing at the hospital, correct? Correct, sir, placing the hospital hold. Yeah, and we've already talked about the hospital hold is a seizure according to your training, right? Correct, sir. Okay. So they're in this conversation regarding the seizure of at the hospital, do you recall whose idea it was to do that? Was it Schmoker? Was it uh, Detective Perez? Or do you have a recollection? I don't, sir. Okay. Did you at any point volunteer um, your opinions regarding whether or not the child should be seized from the parent's custody, from both parents' custody at the hospital? I don't recall giving my opinion because I wasn't aware of the information <coughs> Detective Perez had at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't think she ever briefed me exactly what was going on. Okay. <coughs> so when you, you were sitting there watching this conversation between Detective Perez and Deputy Schmoker, you're sitting there watching it, you really don't know anything about what investigation has been done or what information is available at that point in time. Am I getting that right? I know that they that Deputy Schmoker spoke to her about some of the some of the details of the investigation, but as I sit here today, I can't tell you exactly what he told her or, or what was discussed in regards to the hold. I know that there was a discussion about the hold. Okay, at that point in time, based on the information that you had that you knew, did you have an opinion one way or the other whether or not seizing that night at the hospital? was going to be appropriate under the circumstances. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry. Um, can you Look, I, it might have been a bad question. Let's just have her reread it. And At that point in time, based on the information that you had, that you knew, did you have an opinion one way or the other whether or not seizing that night at the hospital was going to be appropriate under the circumstances? I guess it's vague and overbroad as to the time at which point, because you said at that time, I'm not sure which time. Uh, <coughs> look, let me clarify that. Cause <coughs> when you first arrived at the hospital, you, you met Detective Perez in the parking lot, yes? Correct, sir. Then together you went into the hospital, yes? Correct, sir. Then together you went and met Deputy Schmoker, correct? Correct, sir. And so far, as far as the timing and sequencing goes, that's the way it went in order of priority, correct? Correct, sir. Okay, so in that meeting at that time with Deputy Schmoker, was that when um, Detective Perez and Deputy Schmoker began this conversation about seizing? I do know that there was, yes, there was a conversation about seizing. Okay, but it was at that point in time, that first contact that you had between you, Detective Perez, and Deputy Schmoker. Yes, okay. sometime during that contact, yes. Okay, so that's the timing that we're talking about. Can I go back to the original question and have that reread?
at that point in time, based on the information that you had, that you knew, did you have an opinion one way or the other whether or not seizing that night at the hospital was going to be appropriate under the circumstances? I mean, I think in hindsight, if I'm trying, if I look at what the information that was discussed that night, we're talking about that moment. In that time. moment, I don't. I can answer. I can't answer that, sir, because I know that we got information as we were there, so I don't remember specifically what was discussed in that in that moment. That doesn't really answer my question. Let, let me try it differently, because we talked a little bit earlier mm -hmm. about your training and how when we're determining whether or not there's an exigent circumstance to justify a unwarranted seizure of a child, you have to have specific articulable evidence at the time of the seizure. Do you remember that training? Yes, sir. Okay, so when we're talking about specific articulable evidence at the time of the seizure, that means we restrict our view to the time that we actually make the decision to seize the child, right? Correct. Okay, so. With that in mind, you're standing there, and Detective Perez is next to you, yes? I'm sure she was. Okay, and then Deputy Schmoker's facing you guys? I'm, I'm sure he was okay. at some point. At that moment, when you're hearing them talk about seizing, did you have an opinion one way or the other about whether or not that seizure of the child met the requirements under the law? I don't know that I had an opinion right then and there because I didn't have all the information Detective Perez had. So for me, based, I, I couldn't say that I did or not. I mean, I couldn't say whether I did or not, sir. Okay, so you, couldn't, you, you didn't have an opinion one way or the other? No. Okay. And at that point in time when uh, Deputy Schmoker and Detective Perez were contemplating seizing the child, did you give any input? Did you say, well, hey, you guys, wait a minute. I'm not sure we have enough information or something like that. No, I did not. Why not? Because I didn't know what they had discussed. Um, if Perez had maybe spoken to him before I got there, um, I, I wasn't sure what, exactly what her investigation she okay. had already conducted okay. before she got there, whether it was phone calls or not. Okay. And she didn't tell you whether or not she had actually interviewed any of the doctors or the social worker or the parents, anybody like that, at no. that point in time? No, sir. Okay. At what point in time was it that you first learned that Detective Perez had not yet interviewed either the mother or the father? Well, when we got to the hospital, we got there to interview the parents, mm -hmm. or at least mom at that point. At that point, I knew mom was there with me. Okay. Do you recall roughly about what time it was that you uh, got there to speak with mom? No, sir, it was pretty late. By the time you got there, was Mr. Bruno, Ricardo Bruno, there? I don't remember if Ricardo was there when we got there. Okay. But I at know. some point he was there? Yes, he was. Because you actually uh, were with Detective Perez when Ricardo Bruno was interviewed, right? Correct. Okay. In fact, I think you might have had some questions of Mr. Bruno, correct? Correct. Okay. And you also had some questions of Miss Rachel Bruno, correct? Correct. Okay. So you participated in both interviews? Yes, sir. Okay. But by the time that you participated in those interviews, that is the interview of Rachel and Ricardo Bruno, by that time, at least had already been seized. I know that the, that the matter was discussed. I don't know exactly at what time he was actually, the, the hold was actually placed. Did so I'm not sure if the hold was placed before we spoke with her or at, the, at simultaneous to our interview. Okay, and when you say the, the hold, you're referring to the seizure of the hospital? Correct, sir. Okay. Do you know, was it Deputy Schmoker who seized the child, or was it Detective Perez who seized the child? If you know, you may not know.
I remember Deputy Schmoker was completing a form when I went to um, meet with Rachel. I believe that's what, what he was doing. Okay, and when you say Rachel, that's Rachel Bruno sitting here to my right? Correct. Okay. Um, going back just for a moment to exhibit number 96. Move my glasses for this again. <clears throat> About halfway down, a little more than halfway down the page, it says, if field personnel determine there is reasonable cause to remove a child from their home and from the child's parents' custody for the child's safety, and there are other children in the home, field personnel shall conduct a thorough investigation on each child, each individual child, and must articulate facts detailing the reasonable cause to remove each child. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. When it says here, field personnel, who is that referring to? Deputies working the field. Okay, so for example, in this instance, that would be Deputy Schmoker? Correct, sir. Were there any other deputies working with Deputy Schmoker on this investigation? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Then the next sentence says, simply having reasonable cause to remove a child for his or her safety does not give field personnel the authority to remove other children, that is siblings, in the same or in the home. Did I read that correctly? Correct. Okay. So I think that, does that relate earlier to the rules that uh, we talked about, those safeguards relative to needing to do an investigation as to each child and each parent, an individualized investigation? Correct. Okay. If you skip down to, I guess just one sentence down, to the sentence that begins with Special Victims Bureau. Do you see that? It says Special Victims Bureau Detectives? Yes. Okay. It says Special Victims Bureau Detectives can help direct and give field personnel advice on their investigation. However, Field personnel must ultimately determine if they have exigency as defined in Section 300 to remove each child for their safety, absent consent, or a warrant. Did I read that right? Correct. I want to make sure I understand this clearly because it's an issue in the case. At least according to policy, who is it that's responsible for making the decision about whether or not to seize a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant? Calls for speculation, just to the extent that you know. It would be the individual um, deputy that is it, that is detaining those children. So in this case, them in custody, protective custody. So in this case, that would have been Deputy Schmoker. At least according to your understanding of policy, it would have been Deputy Schmoker's responsibility. Right. He would, he would have had to articulate why the child was placed into protective custody. Okay. And here where it says that uh, Special Victims Bureau detectives can help direct and give field personnel advice, what does that mean? What's your understanding of what your obligations are as a Special Victims Bureau detective in this situation? In, in this particular situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, are you, are you I asking? I mean, a detective generally, not, not you personally, because I, I understand you know, you're there in some different capacity. Generally, your understanding, what would be a special victim, victims bureau detective's obligation under this circumstance? Just general detective X, what's their obligation? It's vague and overbroad, and it's an incomplete hypothetical. Go ahead. Well, for example, um, Deputy Schmoker contacted the, um, the on-call evaluator Right, so he called the evaluator to contact, advise them that the <coughs> child was in, in, in the hospital. So that would be his duty to do that. Um, the detective then 
Perez at that moment was the one that was responding to the hospital. So her, she would now respond to the hospital and conduct her own investigation. Um, I can appreciate that, but it really doesn't address the question. Let's go back to the, the form. There's a formal policy document of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, correct? This exhibit number 96. Oh, this one? Sorry. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I would say yes. Okay. Going back to that sentence, it says Special Victims Bureau detectives can help direct and give field personnel advice on their investigation, right? Correct. Okay. Is it your understanding that as a Special Victims Bureau detective, you would have the authority to actually issue orders to the deputy to order him to seize a child? Or is that something that a decision that he would have the authority to make on his own, or the responsibility to make on his own? We, so I, I can give advice and tell him, these are the steps you need to take or you can take. And obviously every situation is different, um, but it's up to the deputy himself to assess and then articulate why he made that decision. Okay. So just make sure, I appreciate that response. I think you, you're, you're getting there. Just want to make sure I understand correctly. And correct me again if I'm wrong. But the deputy in the field would be the one with the ultimate responsibility to make the decision whether or not to seize the child without first getting a warrant. Am I right so far? Correct the role that the Special Victims Bureau detectives play, at least if they're acting according to policy, would be to advise and counsel the field personnel, that, that is the deputy, about how they might choose to proceed one way or the other. Is that right? Calls for speculation other than what you personally know and have been trained on. Yeah, it's just according, everything I'm doing today is just according to your training and experience. I, I'm not asking you to guess about anything else. That's correct, sir. Okay. Let's do this because I had a bunch of dialogue. Can I have the question reread, please? And then the answer. The role that the Special Victims Bureau detectives play, at least if they're acting according to policy, would be to advise and counsel the field personnel. <clears throat> that is, the deputies, about how they might choose to proceed one way or the other. Is that right? Correct. Okay. It's not the role or the duty or even the responsibility of the Special Victims Bureau detectives to actually make that decision. That is the decision to seize a child without first getting a warrant. Calls for speculation in the state's testimony. Am I right about that? If I am not, it is not my decision to make if I am not the one investigating that case and I'm not in the field, I don't have all the details or the, or the facts. So it's not my decision to make. Okay. So it would actually be the person out in the field who's doing those initial interviews. It would be their decision to make. You might give them instruction or advice, but it's their decision to make, right? Correct. Okay. And that field personnel, again, when we're talking about field personnel out in the field, that would be the deputies. Correct, sir. In this particular case, Deputy Schmucker. Correct. All right, let's take a quick break, and I'm going to go through our stuff. And okay, we, um, we are going off the record. <clears throat> the time is 2.09. We are going back on the record. This is the beginning of disc number three. The time is 2.21. Okay. After that conversation that you described for us earlier, where it's you, Detective Perez, and Deputy Schmalker, and, and they're talking about seizing sometime after that when you went with deputy or detective Perez to interview mom correct correct do you, do you know about how long 
it was after your conversations with uh, Detective Perez and Detective Schmucker, or Deputy Schmucker? No, sir. Can you give me an estimate? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour? I don't think it was an hour. I don't think it was more than an hour, sir. Okay. I know that. Okay. In the time, well, when you were there talking, or when you were there listening, rather, to Deputy Schmucker and Detective Perez talking about seizing, did they also, in that same conversation, bring up the prospect of seizing? I don't remember. I don't remember that that was discussed then. Okay. When do you recall being the first time that you learned that a decision had been made to also seize from both parents, both from Miss Rachel Bruno and from Ricardo Bruno? When's the first time you recall learning about that? I remember correctly, it would have been sometime after we left the hospital when we followed Ricardo to his residence. If I remember that, sir. I, I mean, I'm not for certain, but I think that's when I, I was advised. Advised by who? Uh, Detective Perez. I think it's before we left the hospital on the way to Ricardo's house. Okay, and what did she sure. tell you? I, I don't know exactly that she told me. I just know that I found out at some point, but I don't remember. I, I, I know for sure when we were at his house, I did know that they, that a deputy had responded to the residence with a social worker. Okay. Did you know whether or not at that point in time the deputy had actually, or rather the child had actually been taken by somebody, whether it be the deputy or the social worker? I. I I don't remember that information because I wasn't told exactly what was going on okay. by Detective Perez. Okay. So just make sure I'm understanding correctly then, is that by the time you discovered there, there was even an issue with uh, being seized from his parents, the seizure had already taken place? I'm not sure it had already taken place, but I know that there was something in the works as regards to, to the discussion with uh, removing and taking him into protective custody. I do know that, but I don't remember exactly, sir. I, I wasn't told very much in regards to that. Okay. So you were there for the interview of Rachel Bruno, yes? Yes. And you were there for the interview of Ricardo Bruno, right? Yes. How far apart? How much time elapsed between the completion of Rachel Bruno's um, interview and the beginning of Ricardo Bruno's interview? I, I don't know, sir. That is some strong coffee, man. <laughs> That's like peeling the enamel off my teeth. Um, Do you, do you recall Rachel Bruno's demeanor during her interview? Yes. What was her demeanor? Um, she appeared to be very calm. Um, mm -hmm. At some point during the interview, she laughed at some point, you know, sort of during some of the uh, the questions that were asked, she, I just, I guess to me it appeared like she was not engaged completely, so I wasn't sure if she had a grasp on what, what, what we were there for. Okay. Did it appear to you, when you say it wasn't clear that she had a grasp of what was going on there, what do you mean by that? She just... 
She was very indifferent. What do you mean? Didn't show much emotion. Okay. Do you remember about what time it was? How long she'd been there at the hospital at the point that you met her? Calls for speculation. I know it was very late. Um, <coughs> maybe around midnight. That you were talking with her? It would have been maybe past midnight. Okay. I, I know it was late. And you remember uh, asking her, uh, or rather uh, Detective Perez asking her, about the sequence of events, um, how she discovered the child, what time of morning she discovered the child, uh, screaming, those sorts of things? You yes, I do remember that. Okay, and do you remember that she um, told you guys in the interview that she was awakened by the child's screeching around 4 a.m. on July 8th, 2015? Yes. Okay, so she'd been up from about 4 a.m. until sometime after midnight on July 9th, 2015, by the time that you began your interview with her? Calls for speculation as to how long she was awake. You can go ahead. Um, I do know that she mentioned falling asleep with the child for a couple of hours and then waking up with the child but I don't remember how long it was. It was around 7 a.m. the morning of July 8th, 2015, right? That she woke up with the child on her chest? Calls for speculation. She just said she doesn't recall. I, I know it was a couple of hours, sir. Okay. And when she awoke, it was uh, the doula, Nanny King, who she discovered was with her child in his room at 4 a.m. on uh, July 8th, 2015, right? You remember that? Yes. Okay. When is the first time that you spoke with Shannon King after your interview with uh, Rachel Bruno? It would have been um, in the afternoon of Friday, so I'm pretty sure it was Friday. Um, it would have been date? in the afternoon. Do you remember the date? It, it would have been that same date, July 9th. Okay, but in the afternoon on July 9th. Correct. And by then, Bruno had already been seized from his parents' care. Correct. Okay. Do you know whether or not uh, Detective Perez um, had, before your contact with Shannon King, do you know whether or not Detective Perez had any contact with Shannon King? I'm not aware of any contact with her, sir. What about Deputy Schmoker? Do you know whether or not he had any contact or interviews with Shannon King before your interview with her? I'm not aware of any interviews. Okay. Well, I want to make sure I've got the timing right, then. Is you and Detective Perez begin your interview of Rachel Bruno sometime after midnight on July 9th, 2015, right? Correct. And that was after um, your meeting with Detective Perez and Deputy Schmolker, right? Correct. Okay. Did you talk to anybody in between your meeting with Deputy Perez and, <coughs> or Detective Perez and Deputy Schmolker and your interview with Rachel Bruno? I, I don't think I did. Okay, no doctors, nurses, no, I don't think I did, sir, no. Were you present when Detective Perez talked to anybody other than Deputy Schmucker and Rachel Bruno? No. I believe that she went to speak with medical personnel, and then I went to uh, introduce myself to Rachel and escort her to uh, and find a room to, to speak okay. with her. Okay. So the two of you split up, and by the two of you, I mean... Um, Detective Perez and you split up at some point? Correct, yes. Okay. So you don't know who she talked to or what th those people said? No. Okay. By the time that you were speaking with Rachel Bruno sometime after midnight on July 9th, 2015, did you know yet that or that the decision to seize without first getting a warrant had already been made? Asked and answered. You can answer again. No, sir. Not, not, I don't believe that I knew when we were speaking with Rachel. I, I wasn't aware of anything okay. in regards to... Okay. 
right before you started speaking with Ricardo. You, you did the interview with Ricardo after Rachel, right? Correct. And that would have been sometime, what, maybe around 1 a.m. ish on July 9th, 2015? I'm not exactly sure, but I mean, it was, it was definitely late. It would have been after midnight anyway. Yes. Okay. In between that interview, the interview of Rachel and Ricardo, do you recall learning from any source, whether it's Detective Perez, Schmucker, anybody, that the decision to seize had already been made? No, sir. I, I don't recall knowing okay. at that point. Okay, so let's get, sort of fast forward a little bit to um, Mr. Ricardo Bruno's interview. Where, where did that take place? I'm not sure if we spoke with him in the same room that we spoke with Rachel. I'm not mm -hmm. exactly sure where. Okay, but there, there was a room somewhere where you, you got in a room with him and were able to at least have some privacy of some kind to do the interview? If I recall correctly, yes, at the you, hospital. Yeah, you didn't do it out in the hallway. No, uh, no, I don't think we did. I'm okay. pretty sure we didn't. Okay. Who was present during your interview of Ricardo Bruno? Uh, Detective Perez. Anybody else? Any social workers from Orange County? I don't remember, sir. Okay. If there had been, well, let me ask you this. Did you yourself uh, draft a report? No. Okay. But you did review the reports in preparation for your deposition here today, right? Yes, sir. Do you recall in reviewing those reports seeing any mention of any social workers from Orange County being present during the interview of Ricardo Bruno? I don't recall reading that. Okay. Now, when you first began your interview of, or the interview of Ricardo Bruno, do you recall Detective Perez asking him if he was okay? Saying something like, are you okay? I, no, I don't remember that. Okay. Do you recall Ricardo Bruno's demeanor at the beginning of that interview? I don't recall his demeanor at the beginning. I do remember that he appeared upset. Um, during our contact with him. When you say upset, what do you mean? Like worried uh, for his child? For okay. How upset was he? Calls for speculation. It's vague and overbroad. I mean, you were sitting there watching the guy. Was he shaking? Was he crying? Was he vomiting? How upset was he? I don't remember that he was crying. I just remember that he, he was upset. It was obvious to you based on your training and experience and your observations of him at that time that he was upset? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what about in relation to his child? Did you guys talk to him at all about? As I said here today, I don't remember specifically the the content of the interview, but I do know that by reviewing the reports, there's a mention that we that mentioned. Okay. What do you recall that mention being? I believe that he was asked, and I don't think it was me. I think Detective Perez asked him where he was. Mm -hmm. Asked him. Are you sure that's not a question that was asked during? Rachel's interview? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure, so maybe I'm confusing it. But I don't remember specifically okay. anything in regards to, to Mr. Um, to Ricardo Bruno. Uh, okay, okay. Now, all of these interviews were tape recorded, right? Correct. In preparation for your deposition here today, did you sit down, take a little time, and review those recordings? Uh, no, I did not. Is there a reason why you didn't? Um, I reviewed Detective Perez's supplemental report, mm -hmm. uh, which contained, which I, I believe contained uh, the, okay. the important information in regards to our interview okay. or statements. So as you're sitting here today, you do know for a fact that somebody, either Rachel or Ricardo Bruno, was asked during their interview about where it was, right? Yes. Okay. 
you just don't recall sitting here whether it was during Rachel's interview that question came up or during Ricardo's interview. Correct. Okay. Do you recall at the very outset of Ricardo's interview, him being upset, Detective Perez asking him, are you okay? And, and him responding, let's just start over because we got interrupted. Sorry. I'm looking for a good sound bite. <laughs> Do you recall at the beginning of Ricardo Bruno's interview that he appeared to be upset? Detective Perez asked him, are you okay? And he responded, no, I'm not okay. You took my son. Asked does, that, does that ring a bell? No. Okay, you don't remember that happening at all? No, sir. Are you saying it didn't happen or you just don't remember it? No, I'm saying I don't remember it. Okay. Well, I'll represent to you. I, I did listen to the tape recording and that's exactly what happened. So my question is going to be, in between Rachel Bruno's interview and Ricardo Bruno, the beginning of his interview, did anybody tell you that they had already seized? As I sit here today, sir, I can't tell you that I, 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 somebody told me specifically. I don't remember. I know that at some point I did learn that he was um, okay. removed from the home of his grandmother. He was placed in protective custody. I do know that. Okay. But I don't know at what point. Okay. And when you say he was placed in protective custody, you just don't know when that happened. What, what you mean to say is he was seized from his parents' custody. You just don't know when. Correct. Okay. Do you know whether or not somebody fought to maybe go apply for a warrant before they did that? I don't know. I know I did not discuss a warrant with Detective Perez. Did you ever ask Detective Perez um, something along the lines of, hey, um, Detective Perez, what is the specific articulable evidence you have to show that is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death at the hands of his father? Did you ever have that conversation with Detective Perez? Uh, no, I did not, sir. Why not? As I sat there with her in, during uh, Rachel Bruno's interview, um, and, then, and then speaking with, uh, I guess, some of the information that, I, that was discussed by Deputy Schmoker and her, I didn't have all the facts, but I knew that I, we had a seven-week-old child with head trauma and it was inflicted and there was no reasonable explanation that we knew of. So I did not question. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that it was reasonable at the time. What was reasonable? Seizing, oh. seizing the older child who's with his grandparents? Where mom's at the hospital? What was reasonable? Well, no, I'm speaking in regards to Detective Perez's steps as that she was taken, mm -hmm. that she was taking, for example, with the hold with um, I, I know it was discussed. I, I didn't question it. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that there was a reason why she was, that this was being discussed. And I felt that after the interview with Rachel, I didn't question it because there was another child that I wasn't, I didn't know much about or where the child, um, the physical, um, his physical status at the time. So at that point in time, as far as you knew, there had been no investigation regarding the physical status of Bruno, correct? In the state's testimony. Well, that's what I just understood her to say, and she'll correct me if I was wrong. I personally did not know, no. Okay. But I didn't know what Detective Perez knew. Okay. okay. Did you go out and uh, interview the Chandlers? No, no, I did not, sir. Do you know whether Detective Perez did before she decided to seize the kid? I don't believe that she went to interview the grandparents that night. Did anybody, to your knowledge, go out and investigate the grandparents before they decided to just seize this child? I reviewed the police report and I saw that social worker Todd did respond to the residents. But that was after Detective Perez had already told her to go out and seize the child, correct? Calls for speculation. 
if I remember correctly, it did indicate that Detective Perez and social worker Todd did speak in regards to and his grandparents. Okay. Do you know who it was that actually made the decision to seize that night? Was it Todd or was it Perez or maybe you don't know? I, I wouldn't know, sir. No, I don't know. Okay. Did you play any role whatsoever in the decision to seize from his parents? No, sir. Okay. Am I correct that sitting here today, you don't even recall exactly when it was that he was seized from his parents' care? That's correct. Okay. Based on your, your training, am I correct that, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, there has to be an individualized assessment of each child as to each parent, right? Correct. Okay. What specific articulable evidence did you glean from Mr. Bruno, Ricardo Bruno's interview that led you to believe that he was an immediate danger to either child? Calls for speculation. If you're asking me to look in hindsight or you're asking me right then and there? Right then and there because remember the, the training is at the time of the seizure, you have to have specific articulable evidence and you have to do an individual ass assessment of each child as to each parent, right? Correct. So at that point in time, recognizing the rule, what was your specific articulable evidence to suggest that Ricardo Bruno was any kind of danger to either child? Calls for speculation. <coughs> I didn't make that decision, sir, so I didn't know, I can't tell you what Detective Perez, the information she had at mm -hmm. that time about, Ms. about Ricardo Bruno. But you told me earlier that you agreed with the seizure. You thought the seizure, at least as to was reasonable. Correct, sir. Okay. What about the seizure of as to Mr. Ricardo Bruno? Was well, that reasonable? Calls for a legal conclusion, calls for speculation. Based on what you knew that night at the moment of seizure from Ricardo Bruno, was it reasonable? Also calls for an expert opinion. I think that for me, um, as my own opinion, it would have been that I, I have this child that has, I have, has a severe injury. He was in the care of his mother, his grandmother, that at least we know, and according to what was said was that Ricardo was not in the t in town, um, but we did we couldn't verify that at that moment in that hospital. Well, actually, you spoke with Ricardo, right? Yes. I'll show you exhibit number thirty-seven. You recognize exhibit number thirty-seven? I don't think I actually reviewed this paperwork. Do you know what that is? Yes, sir. It what would is be it? A flight information. I'm sorry? A flight information. Whose flight information? Ricardo Bruno. And what does it say there? Well, it's a travel itinerary. Okay, it says he wasn't present on the 8th, right? Well, that's what it says. Okay, and he actually gave you guys the contact information for the gentleman that he was traveling with, didn't he? <coughs> Yes, I, I remember that he gave a phone number. But nobody bothered calling that guy to verify Mr. Bruno's story before seizing and right? Calls for speculation. Nobody that you know of, anyway. I know I did not. I'm not sure if Detective Perez did. Okay. So if your reason for seizing and from Ricardo Bruno was that you weren't sure whether he was really out of town or not, and you had the phone number to verify, why didn't you verify? Calls for speculation in the state's testimony. Like I said, sir, it wasn't, I did not make that decision. Um, but I can't 
say that I wouldn't have done what Detective Perez did at the time, knowing that I could not prove m Mr. Ricardo could have given us a phone number, but that did not mean that that person wasn't going to be covering up for him. Uh, it's just information needed to be verified. Okay, let's go backwards a little bit. We talked this morning about your training, and you told me, I want to make sure I got this right, that before making the decision to seize a child without first getting a warrant, you have to conduct a thorough and reasonable investigation. Am I right? Correct. Okay. So part of a thorough investigation would be following up to verify people's stories, right? Yes, sir. Okay, but you didn't do that. Nobody did that. Calls for speculation. Right? Nobody did that. I did not, sir. And you don't know whether or not Perez did either, right? I don't know. Or Schmoker? No, I don't. Okay. And yet, knowing the rules that we have to do a thorough investigation before seizing a kid without a warrant, there's got to be an individualized assessment as to each parent, each child, you still feel it was reasonable to seize that night from Ricardo Bruno. Am I understanding you right? Because if I'm not, this is your time to explain it. I don't know everything that was told to Detective Perez. And at that moment, I don't know that I would have done exactly at that time. I would have detained it at that point. But I, I, I do see and I do agree with her steps because she was trying to protect this child. Uh, I feel that the immediate danger was there because we didn't know. Ricardo could have been telling us all these things, but we still needed to verify it. And that gave us time to do so. Okay, that says, to, right? That you're, you're saying because you had this severe injury, you didn't, you were trying to protect him by seizing him, right? Yes, sir. At that point in time, though, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in your training too, is that you have to be able to establish a link between the severe injury and the perpetrator, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And here you had two or three potential perpetrators, right? You had Shannon King, who spent the entire night with the baby while mom was sleeping. Yes. Correct. Then you had mom, who was sleeping until she was awakened at 4 a.m. by a screech, right? Correct. And then you had grandma, who at some point during the day on the 8th came to assist mom, right? Correct. And as far as you knew at that point in time, that is the point in time the decision was made to seize Nobody had any information about dad other than the fact that mom had said he was out of town on a business trip, correct? If I recall correctly, yes. Okay, so we have three perps, child's in the hospital, or three potential perps, child's in the hospital, yeah? Correct. Did you have any evidence to suggest that mom would take the, ho take the child from the hospital and flee? I don't think I had any evidence, but I, no, not okay. me per se, per se. Did anybody that you know of have any evidence to suggest that mom would take the child from the hospital and flee that night? I, I can't tell you that as in regards to Detective Perez or, or Deputy Schmoker. Okay. I can tell you that myself, I, I don't think I did. Okay. To your knowledge, did anybody have any evidence that mom was going to interfere with the medical treatment of that child? I personally did not know. Okay. Now, now, you saw the hospital bed, didn't you? Yes. Okay, and he had like tubes running out of him. His head was in a, a band. Yes, sir. Yeah. Didn't look like he was going to be moving anywhere, right? Calls for speculation. Not on his own, anyway. Correct, sir. Okay. And in fact, it appeared to you that to remove him would have been a danger. Vague and overbroad. At that point, yes. Yeah. And he was in that room and there were machines hooked up to him? Yes. Okay. There were nurses that would come in and out and monitor his progress? Yes. And doctors? I'm sure there was. I don't remember doctors, but yes. And there's a lot of hospitalist staff around to monitor the child? Yes. Did you have any evidence at all to suggest that in spite of being in the hospital, with all these tubes and machines attached to him and doctors and nurses coming in and out of the room, that mom would do anything to harm that child.
cause for speculation? I wasn't just basing it on his injuries. I was, or the fact that, like you said, he couldn't, he wasn't going anywhere. It's, I, I didn't know if mom was the actual perpetrator because of the explanation that was given. So you were speculating? I just think we didn't have enough information to know whether there was, uh, that he would be safe. But that's not the test, is it? The test isn't whether or not you have information to prove he'll be safe, is it? The, mm. test, the test is whether or not you have specific and articulable evidence to show the child's in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death at the hands of the parents, right? That's the test. Correct. Okay. So it doesn't matter that you couldn't prove the child was safe. Your obligation was to prove the child would be in danger if left where the parents, with the parents, right? I don't know. I know that the information based on what I, I heard in the conversations, I deemed that Rachel Bruno was a danger and that child would be in danger in her custody. Hold on a second. I'm going to object to that as non-responsive. I'm going to reserve my right to move to strike it. Can I have the question reread, please? Listen really carefully to the question because the answer you're giving me is not what I'm looking for here. Okay. So it doesn't matter that you couldn't prove the child was safe. Your obligation was to prove the child would be in danger if left with the parents, right? Correct. Okay. So when we're going through that <coughs> test, that obligation, that is the specific articulable facts, no hunches, no speculations, right? Correct, sir. Going through the specific articulable facts to show that mom is an immediate danger to the child that night at the hospital. You with me so far? Yes. What you had in terms of evidence was the severity of the injury to, to uh, I think you said, seven-month-old child? A seven-week-old. Seven-week, I'm sorry. Severity of injury to a seven-week-old child, right? Correct. Shannon King, who spent the entire night on July 8th with the child, right? Correct. Okay. And uh, mom, who woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning with the child screeching, right? Correct. Did you think for a moment that it could have been Shannon King that injured this child? Yes, there were several people. Several people. So you had, nothing, you had nothing specific to pin on mom. Right, you had several people that had access to the child. Aside from mother having um, had access to the child, uh, I did question to, m within myself. Uh, it did take, it appeared that it took her a while to get the child medical care. So that was a concern of mine. Um, but ultimately she got the child medical care. In fact, she's the one that brought the child to the hospital. Correct. Okay. Once she was able to get her mother to come over and help her out, the two of them took the child to the hospital. Correct, sir. Okay. So, again, well, let me ask you this first. Maybe you never learned this. Did you learn in any of your training and your experience that past injury to a child is an insufficient basis for a finding of exigency? I, I understand the concept, sir. I believe I have been trained on that. Okay. So the delay in seeking medical treatment, what, 12 hours prior to the time that you got involved on, in the case, that delay, if I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying that delay somehow caused the child to be in danger?
I was not sure um, that Rachel Bruno, not, I, I, I was not sure that she acted accordingly and that she was able to protect that child. And that was a concern of mine as far as, if I remember correctly, her statement was that the child started crying at 4 a.m., fell asleep with her, was awake, uh, missed a couple of feedings, waited for her mom to, uh, I believe it was her mother or mother-in-law, to get there, and then took the child to the hospital. Um, so to me, that child was in danger uh, at the time. Well, did Miss Bruno, did you have any reason to suggest that Miss Bruno somehow knew that morning at 4 a.m. or between 4 a.m. and 11 a.m. that this child had suffered a severe head injury? Calls for speculation. Well, I mean, she's the one that has to have reasonable and articulable evidence. I'm just delving into it. Can I have the question reread, please? Do you have any evidence to suggest that? Anything at all? I think at that time it was pointed out that the child did have a, a bump in the back of the head. And it was, it was obvious. And when you said at that time, that would have been around, what, 8 p.m. the evening of the 8th, after the child had already been at the hospital for hours? No, I'm saying at the time that I when, when the investigation was being conducted, that we learned that the child did have that bump. Mm -hmm. Had a bump. Did anybody talk to you about how long it would take for a bump like that to form after an injury? No, sir. No, I don't remember specifically speaking to somebody about that. you have any specific medical training that would inform you, in your view, about how long it would take for a bump like that to form? Minutes? Hours? Any idea at all? Um, no, sir. Okay. So again, you would have been speculating? I, I, yes. Okay. But we know that we can't speculate when we're talking about seizing a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant, right? Correct, sir. Am I also correct that when you guys were concerned about the perpetrator, whether it be mom, Shannon King, grandmother, you couldn't at that point in time pin it on any of them, right? Correct. And had you done so, that also would have been based on speculation, correct? Or a hunch? I'm not sure what you're asking. Hey, if I ask you, who did it? You couldn't definitively tell me who did it. Correct. Okay. And if you did tell me, oh, Shannon King did it, that'd just be speculation. Correct. Same with respect to mom. If you had said, oh, mom did it, that would just be speculation. Correct. Okay. But I think we talked about your training earlier that speculation hunches do not meet the requirement of specific articulable evidence, right? Correct, sir. Okay. Let's talk about a little bit. I think we've kind of exhausted. Now, okay, now for a quick break? Sure. We are going off the record. The time is 3 o'clock. <clears throat> We are going back on the record. The time is 3.12. Let's talk about all the same rules apply with respect to warrants in relation to right? Yes, sir. Okay. And you are aware that at least after the interview of Rachel Bruno, you were aware that was with his grandparents that night, right? Yes. Okay. And Rachel Bruno, she was at the hospital, right? Correct. Pretty much all day. Calls for speculation. 
Well, she was at the hospital when we got there, yes. And she told you that she had been at the hospital since she originally brought right? If I remember correctly, yes, sir. And before you began the interview with Ricardo, uh, Detective Perez had released Rachel Bruno to go sleep in the room, is that right? I don't know where where Rachel went. You don't remember? Well, okay, let's let's eliminate where she went to sleep. You do remember that Detective Perez released her so that she could go get some sleep somewhere in the hospital, right? Calls for speculation. I mean, I can't say that. I know that she went to sleep, sir, but I know that at some point she left. Okay. Did she leave the hospital or just leave the room? I. I just know that we no longer had contact with her after the interview. Okay. Did you have any information at all, any specific articulable information at all to suggest she was going to run right out there to the Chandler's home and hurt? Calls for speculation. I personally don't think I did, sir. Okay. What about anybody else that you were meeting with that day? You were there with Detective Perez. Did you hear her say she had any specific articulable information at all to suggest Rachel Bruno was somehow going to go injure her child that night? Detective Perez did not express any, any of that to me. I mean, she didn't tell me exactly. She didn't give me a lot of information. Okay. I, I just kind of assisted her. So. I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. That, and that's fair. I mean, on a lot of this stuff, based on your earlier testimony, I would expect you not to know. With respect to Rachel Bruno and Bruno, based on what you knew at that time, what evidence did you have to suggest she was going to inflict any injury at all on while he was under the care of his grandparents that night? asked and answered. Go ahead. I didn't have a lot of information or actually much information because of the fact that I wasn't mm -hmm. present with Detective Perez in regards to whatever information she was gathering. Uh, Detective Perez told me what she wanted to tell me or what she needed to tell me and she didn't confer with me or mm -hmm. I, I really didn't have much information, sir. Uh, as to either child. What did she tell me? No, you didn't have much information at all as to either child. You. Me per se, no, not, yeah, not right, offhand. Right. I mean, not firsthand. So you can't really, sitting here today, you can't really say at that time I thought either seizure was reasonable because you just didn't have the information, right? That's correct, sir. Okay. So with respect to Bruno in relation to Rachel Bruno, do you believe that, uh, knowing what you know now, Detective Perez's decision to seize from Rachel was reasonable? Calls for speculation, calls for a legal conclusion, calls for an expert opinion. Well, I think she is an expert, so anyway, go ahead. Do you need the question reread again? Yes, please. Sure. So with respect to Bruno, in relation to Rachel Bruno, do you believe that, knowing what you know now, Detective Perez's decision to seize Rachel was reasonable? It calls I, for speculation. I still don't have all of the information that uh, Detective Perez had. I, I did read her supplemental report. Um, but I don't. I didn't review the medical reports or anything, any of that, sir. So. In all honesty, I couldn't tell you because I don't, I didn't conduct the investigation. I wasn't the lead investigator. I don't know her thought. I wasn't in her, asking her about her thought process. Okay. So if I'm understanding right, you can't tell me one way or the other here today, even though you've reviewed all the reports, you can't tell me one way or the other whether, based on your training and experience, she had reasonable cause to seize from mom on July 9th, 2015. Am I understanding you right? In, in regards to... Yeah. Uh, 
Based on the police report that I read, sir, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I couldn't give you an opinion. You didn't, see, you didn't see anything in that report, any facts or specific evidence in that report that stood out to you to suggest that somehow mom was going to rush out that night before somebody could get a warrant and harm in some way? You didn't see any facts that just stood out on the face of the report to suggest that? No, sir. I reviewed it, but I wasn't looking for those facts. Okay. Now let's talk about with respect uh, to and dad, Ricardo Bruno. How was he during the interview? What was his demeanor? Asked and answered. That's okay. Uh, Ricardo? Yeah. Appeared to be upset, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. You remember how long his interview lasted? I don't remember, sir. Do you remember hearing anything in that interview that you would believe would satisfy the specific articulable evidence requirement that you've learned over the years? Did you hear any, anything in his interview that you believed would support a claim that he was somehow a danger to that night, July, that early morning hours, July 9th, 2015? Anything at all? I don't remember the actual interview. I remember some of the content, but I don't, I can't tell you that I, I remember anything specific. Well, you read all the reports, right? Correct, sir. And that was, what, a couple days ago? Yes. Okay. How, mu how much time did you spend preparing for this deposition? Several hours. Several, what's that, five, seven, ten? Mm, anywhere between maybe eight to ten hours. Okay, so basically a full work day or close to it. Correct, sir. Okay. Um, and reviewing the reports in preparation for your deposition, was there any evidence in there at all to suggest that Ricardo Bruno, that day, July 9th, 2015, posed an immediate risk of any kind at all to his child? Calls for speculation calls for a legal conclusion. I don't recall seeing anything in the reports, but I wasn't specifically looking for that, so I, sure. I don't recall, sir. When you were with Detective Perez um, after midnight on July 9th, 2015, at any point in time did you guys discuss the fact that there was no evidence whatsoever to suggest that Ricardo Bruno was an immediate danger to his son. I don't think I discussed that with Detective Perez at all. Did either, did, did you and her discuss the fact that maybe I should look a little bit closer before, you know, pulling the trigger on seizing at least no, sir. Okay. You didn't think that was something important? Because I was not the lead investigator, because I only went to assist as she needed me, which mm -hmm. she really didn't. <laughs> um, I, I trusted the information that she was gathering, the steps that she was taking, that mm -hmm. she was taking at the time. But you didn't know what information she had. You knew a limited amount, but you didn't know what she had. Correct, sir. So it, I, I, did it not, I did not discuss it. She was conducting her investigation. I did not want to, want to interrupt mm -hmm. um, the steps that she was taking. Um, so I can't, I mean, I, I don't know. Okay, that, that's fair. I think I already asked you this, but you, you don't have any specific medical training relating to um, child abuse pediatrics, right? No, sir. Okay. Or actually relating to the care of children at all, right? Correct. Okay. Do you have kids yourself? No, it's uh, invasion of privacy and I'll instruct you not to answer. Oh, I'll ask her in front of the jury, that's fine. Okay. You won't get the instruction there. Okay.
Do you know um, the level of Deputy Schmoker's investigation? Do you know what steps he took or what he did there at the hospital that night? I reviewed his police report, mm -hmm. and based on that, mm -hmm. because I don't remember specifically what he said the night of, mm -hmm. uh, I know that he responded to the hospital. He spoke with Rachel. I know that he spoke with um, someone from the medical staff. And then noti and at some point he notified Special Victims Bureau. Okay. Am I correct that at the conclusion of his investigation, um, Deputy Schmoker concluded that the only way could have obtained his injuries was from blunt trauma from an unknown object or person. Calls for speculation. That was his conclusion. Go ahead. Are you asking me if that's what he wrote in the report? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds familiar, sir, yes. Okay. So uh, it, I want to make sure I'm correct on this. At the point in time that you were there with uh, Detective Perez talking to Deputy Schmoker, do you recall him telling you at this point we don't know who did this? Or words to that effect? Yeah, I don't think he ever pointed out a specific person mm -hmm. as to who, who inflicted the injury on the child. Okay. <clears throat> I'll show you what we'll mark as exhibit number two to your deposition. There you go. You recognize exhibit number two? Yes, sir. What is it? It's the police report uh, Deputy Schmoker wrote. Okay. And you've reviewed this report before? Yes. About two days ago or so. Um, this one I reviewed, I think, three days ago. Okay. If I can get you to turn to page number 76ORG003491. Towards the middle of the page there, there's a uh, paragraph that begins V slash, do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Right after the V slash, it says SJ father, right? Yes. What does that mean, SJ? A subject victim. Okay. What does that I'm mean? I'm sorry, subject. Okay, so at that point, he was not even identified as a victim, am I right? Not in the actual narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, correct. He, he did not label him as a victim. Okay. So at that point in time, there was actually no suspicion whatsoever that any crime had even been committed as to, is that right? Calls for speculation. I mean, if you're asking me to base it on this right here, where in this paragraph, it doesn't indicate that he was a victim. Well, you read the whole report when you read it, right? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, so based on what Deputy Schmoker had gleaned during his investigation that evening, am I correct that at that point in time, the child, Bruno, was not um, identified as having been the victim of a crime? Calls for of any crime. Calls for speculation. Uh, correct. Okay. You see here it says uh, 
Father Ricardo Bruno arrived at the hospital just prior to, looks like SVB's arrival. Did I read that right? Yes. SVB, would that have been you and Detective Perez? Correct. So by the time you got to the hospital, does that refresh your recollection that Ricardo Bruno was already there? No, sir. I mean, he wrote that, but I don't remember specifically. Okay. But if he's saying that, I mean, okay. it must have happened. And at that point in time, Deputy Schmoker, he was also unable to interview uh, the nanny, Shannon King, right? Cause for speculation. Well, you can turn to 76ORG003492. You see right there at the top of the page? Yes. Did he tell you that evening when you were out there with uh, Detective Perez that, hey, I haven't been able to contact the nanny? I don't remember him saying that, but I know that it's in the report. Okay. And you know that you didn't uh, contact the nanny that night either, right? Correct. And as far as you know, um, Detective Perez didn't contact the nanny that night either, right? Calls for speculation. Said as far as you know. As far as I know, correct, right. yes. That way you're not speculating. Now you went out to the Bruno home in the early morning hours of July 9th, 2015 with Detective Perez, correct? Correct, sir. Okay, did you go through the home, inspect the home? I remember we walked to the, to the bedroom. Mm -hmm. I don't remember walking through the whole home. Okay, did you take pictures? I, I did not, sir. Did you notice anything uh, that struck you as odd or out of the ordinary as you were walking through the home? Not that I remember, no. Okay. See a rock on the floor next to the door in the uh, room? I do remember the mention of a rock, but I don't remember specifically seeing it. Okay. Who mentioned it? I believe Perez did, Detective Perez. Okay. In what context? I don't remember specifically, sir. Okay. Do you recall Ricardo providing you guys with Miss King's contact information that night out at his home? I do remember that he did. Okay, and is that where you got the information that you needed in order to contact her the next day? Or uh, within the few hours. I, I believe that's what Detective Perez used. I, I don't know, I didn't contact her. Oh, you never contacted Miss King? You never spoke with her? In person, yes, but not via telephone. Okay, when did you speak with her in person? Um, I met Detective Perez at the Special Victims Bureau office at, in Whittier. Okay, and was that when Miss King was coming in to take her lie detector test? Correct. Okay, that's the test where the result was inconclusive, right? Correct. What does that mean when somebody takes a lie detector test and the result is inconclusive? Vague and overbroad. Calls for speculation. Just based on your 21 years of experience, training, etc. I was going to say, I'm not a polygrapher, sir. Um, yeah, but you as a detective, you rely on polygraphers and their opinions and conclusions, right? Yes, we, we do use that as a tool. Okay, um, so let's talk about it. What does it mean when a polygrapher, that is a lie detector, tells you, look, this person's lie detector test, the results are inconclusive? What does that mean? It's still vague and overbroad as to what does it mean. To you as a detective, what does it mean? Um, 
Well, I've been giving different, I've been given different explanations as to why tests would be inconclusive by the actual polygraphers. Um, and I remember specifically one where uh, the person had a medical problem, uh, they weren't able to test correctly. The, um, the uh, person was too cold and kept on moving their arm. I, I mean, that's about it, sir, I don't know exactly. In those circumstances, like for example, a person has a medical condition or they're too cold, the standard procedure would be for them to sit for another examination, right? Um, I guess it would depend on what type of investigation. Well, let's call it a, a serious child abuse, a felony investigation. The standard procedure would be to try to have that person sit for another exam. Yes, if they volunteer to do so, yes. All right. Well, you would actually ask them. They don't have to stand up and say, hey, hey, let me do it again. You'd actually ask them. Correct, correct. Okay. And uh, does it mean anything to you if they refuse? They say, no, I'm not going to do that. As an investigator, a detective, does it, does it you know, fire off any red flags in your mind and if they just say, no, you had your shot. I'm not doing another polygraph. Not necessarily, um, because uh, there may be various reasons why the person isn't willing to take it again. Like what? Um, I mean, I can't say sorry specifically, but I don't think that it ra that it raises a flag. Okay. So you you didn't think that the fact that Shannon King had an inconclusive polygraph test, lie detector test, and refused to sit for another one, you, that didn't sound any red flags to you. I don't remember, I don't remember, so after the, she took the polygraph exam, I don't remember what happened with Shannon King. I, I okay. wasn't, I didn't follow up with Detective Cruz. Um, I read the report that it said it was inconclusive, mm -hmm. but I don't know, sir. Okay. Did you ever go out to her home and look at her home? I did not, no. Did uh, you ever suggest to Detective Perez, Deputy Schmoker, Deputy Lee, anybody? that maybe they should go out and seize Shannon King's children? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any knowledge of that. Okay, you didn't do that anyway. I, I did not know. Even though she had an inconclusive test on her lie detector. I wasn't aware that she had an inconclusive test, so I w I'm okay. not sure exactly after that. Okay. Am I correct that, at least in so far as you understand it, the reason that was seized from both parents' care was because of the seriousness of his injuries and the fact that you had three potential suspects, none of whom could give you what you deemed to be an acceptable response as to how the injuries were sustained? Calls for speculation, and it may misstate her prior testimony. And again, if I'm saying anything wrong, you, you tell me that. Do you need the question we read? Yes, please. Yeah. Am I correct, at least insofar as you understand it, the reason that he was seized from both parents' care was because of the seriousness of his injuries and the fact that he had three potential suspects, none of whom could give you what you deemed a reasonable explanation. I can't answer that, sir, because I didn't have the information that Detective Perez had or, de or Deputy Schmoker. Mm -hmm. So I, I, can't, I can't answer that. Okay. Same with respect to Bruno. The only evidence that you know of that existed at that point to, uh, in relation to the seizure of Bruno without first getting a warrant was the fact that his little brother had sustained serious injuries. There were three suspects, and there was insufficient information as to any one of them, from any one of those suspects, as to how injuries were sustained. I don't know that those were the only factors considered, sir. I, I can't answer it. I don't know what Detective Perez or, Schmoak, or Deputy Schmoker knew at the time. Well, having reviewed all their reports, spending 10 hours preparing for your deposition, going through all the facts that you had to go through in that process, 
what else is there? They were required to write down all of their specific articulable evidence in their reports, right? They, that is a requirement. I'm not sure if that was completed. I, like I said, I wasn't looking for that in the reports. Okay. Do you have an opinion here today as to, uh, no, I guess we already asked that. You don't, so we don't need to replow that ground. Do you know whether or not everything that Detective Perez did that night complied with the policies and procedures of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department? Calls for speculation. I understand you said, do you know, but I'm just Okay, that's fair. I, yeah. I don't know, sir. Okay, what about with respect to your conduct that night? Did everything, or actually, yeah, that, that early morning hours and day, July 9th, 2015. Did everything that you did in relation to Bruno comply or comport with the regularly established customs, policies, and practices of the County of Los Angeles Sheriff's Department? As far as I know, yes, which it wasn't much because I was just assisting. Um, I didn't really take action or decide on anything, but I mean, I was there, so I, yeah. I would say I did. No good deed goes unpunished, right? <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Now, with respect to with respect to getting a warrant to remove a child from the custody of its parents, have you ever done that? No, sir. Do you know if there even is a special process for doing that? As far as I know, if there, I've never actually, me personally, I've never seen anything specific mm -hmm. um, outlining the steps to remove a child through a warrant. Um, but I would follow the same protocol as if I were conducting um, a search on a, on a house to remove some property or evidence. Okay, so as, as far as you understand it, based on your training and 21 years of experience with the department, make sure I'm understanding this right, the process of getting a warrant, whether it be a search warrant, arrest warrant, a seize a child warrant, it would basically be the same process. Correct, sir. Okay, describe that process for me. I know that there's going to be an affidavit and an application that you make to a judge, right? Correct, sir. Okay, what happens from there? So after I complete my affidavit, um, I have a supervisor review it. Uh, they, they obviously review everything in regards to Nexus and, and anything else that I might need to add to the warrant. Um, after that is reviewed, then I have to present it to a judge. Okay, and you can, you can do that process either in writing or over the telephone, right? Correct, however, you still need to have the written affidavit um, when you present it to the judge. Hmm. I might have something wrong then. It's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you know, you're out in the field and time doesn't permit you to get in front of the judge. You can actually call in and get a duty judge. They'll swear out your statement there over the phone and then issue an order. And then later on, you can actually file the written support for the warrant. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I, 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 miss, I misspoke. Um, that is correct. So the telephone warrant would be different as in I, me presenting it to the judge in, pre in person or in uh, via email or fax. Okay, so you could, you could obtain a warrant or seek to obtain a warrant either in person, by email, by fax, or by telephone. Right? Correct, but um, you still have to write down your, your reasons, my reasons, my probable cause, right. um, and present that and have that recorded and That's then right. transcribed. Right, but 
in the instance where we're doing that, seeking the, app, the warrant, the issuance of a warrant by telephone, all the written materials would follow. They would be things that you would file later, after the telephone call. I've never, so I can tell you that I believe that yes, you can do that, do it that way. I have never done it that way because I know that for me, it takes me a while to put my thoughts together and make sure that I have everything squared away. So I'm, I can't tell you, but yes, I believe that you can do it that way. Okay. Anybody ever give you any training about how long it takes you to get a warrant to do it by telephone? No, sir. In regards to time frame, no. Uh, they don't actually give, I don't think I've ever heard anything about time frames for how to prepare or, or how much time it, for any type of warrant. Have you ever yourself, of, of any kind of warrant, have you ever gotten a telephone warrant? Or a court order by telephone? I have, sir. When? Was it when you were in patrol or as a detective? That might help. As a detective. Okay. How did you go about doing that? I prepared my my statement. I prepared my affidavit statement and my and my uh, affidavit, and I obtained a phone number for the judge um, through the command post. The judge called me back, and I had the judge swore me in. Um, I read my actual statement to the judge. And then that judge told me, okay, I find probable cause. And then he, I was instructed to write in the judge's name. Okay. That process, how long did that take? I'm trying to remember. That was quite a bit because I remember it was a sexual assault investigation. So... couple of hours two three hours maybe would be a fair estimate on this particular one I believe yeah. it took me uh, anywhere between two to three hours before the sergeant actually looked at it and uh -huh. reviewed its contents okay and then once the sergeant looks at it you're cleared to make a phone call yes sir okay. and then waited for a judge to call me okay and how long did you have to wait for the judge to call you back I don't remember specifically sir but I don't think it was more than an hour okay and you'd made a comment that this was a sexual assault um, investigation, a warrant arising, at least in the context of a sexual assault investigation. Um, did that make it more complex than it otherwise normally would be? Vague and overbroad. Um, no, I was just thinking about the actual, the actual case, but um, uh, no, I, I don't think it did. I mean, okay. no, I don't think it did. Was that the only time that you recall that you've gotten a warrant by telephone? No, there was another time that I got a telephonic um, warrant. What sort of case was that? It was, um, I was, it was also for a sexual assault and I was requesting for DNA, I believe, I believe. How long did that one take you? Trying to think. Um, this one had two suspects, so I think no, it took me a longer. I don't know, sir. I, maybe about three hours, I think, and to complete my actual okay. statement. Would it be a fair estimate to say that, as a detective with the County of Los Angeles uh, Sheriff's Department, on average, and I know this is going to be sort of broad on average to get a telephone warrant or to make an application for a telephone warrant, it would take you somewhere between two and four hours. It is overbroad and it's vague and it's an incomplete hypothetical. Just based on your experiences. I mean, I can't say, sir. I, I, I you know every situation, every investigation has been different, so I can't tell you I know for me it takes me longer just because it takes me longer to process everything and and I'm I review everything like three times so I mean I can't tell you on average but on the two that you've done it took between two and four hours the, the two that I can think of right now yes okay. yes
And that two to four hours, that's consistent with your own statement that you take a little longer, you review everything two or three times, maybe are a little more thorough than other people might be. Calls for speculation as to what other people do. Go ahead. Well, I mean, just based on what I do and I know how I work, it does take me, does take me longer. Mm -hmm. Or at least for me, it seems long, so. Okay. How many children have you removed in your entire career? How many children have you removed from the custody of their parents? I could not give you. An estimate's fine. I don't expect you to be able to say, you know, 17. I, I don't expect that. But give me a range. That would be fine. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm thinking. I mean, I've been, in, I, I've been in the field since 2002. I would say no more than 100. In any of those, let's just assume, could it be less than 100? It, it could be, I mean, I don't. It could be less than 100, sir, I don't remember, I mean. There's been a lot of them. Yes. In any of those situations where you remove children from the custody of their parents, did you ever get a warrant? Ever? No. Okay. Were you ever instructed <coughs> by your supervisor that, hey, you know, there's circumstances here, you've got, you know, 100 removals, just statistically there should be some warrants that you got in there? It calls for speculation. No, it doesn't. My question was very clear. Can you please reread the question? I'm not asking her to speculate. I'm asking her if an event happened. Were you ever instructed by your supervisor that, hey, you know, there's circumstances here. You got, you know, 100 removals. Just statistically, there should be some warrants that you got in there. I withdraw my objection that it calls for speculation, but it is an incomplete hypothetical. Go ahead. Uh, no, sir. Have you ever been counseled in any way that, uh, you know, before you remove one of these kids, you, you need to explore very seriously whether or not you need to get a warrant? No. Did anybody ever, out of those hundred kids that you removed, did anybody ever come to you and question as to whether or not you needed to get a warrant to remove any of those kids. No, I don't recall anybody questioning it. Am I correct that as a matter of practice with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, you typically do not get warrants to remove children from the custody of their parents? Mm, cause for speculation. Was for a legal conclusion? Just based on your 21 years with the agency. Based on on what I experienced her and what I know, I, I don't know. I think that's. I think you're correct. Okay. All right. Subject to reservation. Once we figure out which documents should have been produced that weren't. Um, I believe we're done for the day with this witness. No questions. None? No questions. Really? All right, same step, right? Same yes. step. All right. Okay to go off the record? Yes. I don't know. Yeah. We are going off the record. The time is 3.52.